Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see such a uh, wonderful turnout of people here this morning for our uh, Denon Environmental Institute uh, Symposium. Uh, I'm Don Sparks. I'm director of the Delaware Environmental Institute, and I welcome you to the second Denon Research Symposium. I want to especially welcome our new uh, environmental faculty, some of whom you'll hear from in a few minutes. Uh, major goals of Denon from the outset have been to add value to the environmental portfolio at the University of Delaware, to build on the excellence of the faculty, and to enhance competitiveness in securing funding and training of graduate students by integrating environmental science and engineering research with environmental policy, economics, humanities, and social dynamics. Over the past two years, it is readily apparent that environmental interest and expertise at UD is broad and extensive. We have over 120 University of Delaware faculty affiliated with Denon. Through highly successful cluster and environmental humanities faculty searches, we have hired faculty who fill major voids and significantly strengthen our efforts to integrate the social sciences and humanities with environmental science and engineering. At the symposium today, you will hear from the new faculty and explore ways that academics from various disciplines can collaborate to address multidimensional environmental challenges. At this time, I'm very pleased to introduce our provost, Tom Apple. I'm very grateful to Tom for uh, his strong support of the Delaware Environmental Institute for the past two years. Tom. Thank you, Don. It's a real great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I can't think of a better way uh, to start 2012 than by focusing on our commitment to building a university-wide interdisciplinary research community. This academic year, we've seen numerous examples of the power of collaboration. We've hosted research colloquia in the social and health sciences. We've made tremendous progress on our interdisciplinary science and engineering building. And today, we welcome our new faculty members who came to UD as part of last year's environmental cluster search. That's especially gratifying to me. As part of our path to prominence, we support multidisciplinary efforts to develop solutions to significant time-critical issues in the environment, energy, and resource sustainability. Our overarching objective is to make UD a national and international resource for environmental research, technology, education, and policy. And our four new cluster hires are leading the way in making that happen. By bringing faculty together and fostering interdisciplinary research, we're creating the opportunity for more cutting edge research and for multidisciplinary research teams that work across our traditional academic disciplines. We wouldn't be able to do this work if it weren't for our faculty who are bridging silos pooling their expertise to approach old challenges, but in novel and new, more powerful ways. When we began marketing our cluster hires, we knew there'd be interest. We knew there were experts in the field. We knew we were generating a buzz by recruiting for environmental areas at a time when most universities were contracting their hires. What we didn't know was how large the applicant pool would be. We received more than 500 applications. And Don tells me we've received 80 more. So we're, we're getting up in the, in the area of about 600 applications. And these are from both brand new PhDs and senior researchers in the field. And the numbers speak for themselves. We've hired four out of those more than 500. These four new hires, they epitomize the phrase that we use to describe the University of Delaware, we're a talent magnet. We're very fortunate that their research and expertise is now based here at the University of Delaware, where we look forward to their long and extremely productive careers. I'd like to take a minute to recognize the people who served on the search committee, 
Sifting through 500 plus applications is a big job. And it was perhaps made bigger because we had every college rec represented on the committee. So it's with great thanks that I acknowledge the members of the search committee. Dan Leathers from the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment who chaired the search. Don Sparks from the College of Agricultural and Natural Resources and really the driving force behind Denon. Janet Johnson and Murray Johnston from the College of Arts and Sciences. Steve Dentel from the College of Engineering. Danielle Ford from the College of Education and Human Development. Christopher Knight from the College of Health Sciences. And Alan Fisher from the Lerner College of Business and Economics. And I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't mention Sandy Goodley of the Earth, Ocean, Environment Dean's Office who worked to compile, sort, and organize all the applications with the assistance of Kelly DeRemus and of course Amy Broadhurst of Denon. So thank you again. The process took nearly eight months, but we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the tireless commitment and dedication of this group. So here we are. We have a community of scholars and researchers with different areas of expertise but common goals. And that's ideal for where we're going. We have an extensive and important portfolio of environmental research. To use a sports analogy, our bench is very deep. When it comes to water-related sciences, soil and environmental chemistry, environmental engineering, climate science, and environmental monitoring and modeling. And we have a great team of policy specialists and social scientists to guide us in the application of that scientific knowledge to help us translate that work into society. With 20 centers dedicated to environmental and energy research, we're generating some of the world's most promising science in the field. But energy and environment aren't just key strengths at UD. They're our key growth areas. We've been making major investments here, and we're going to continue to do so. And that starts with our faculty. Our cluster hires are a terrific example of faculty coming together from different disciplines, but yet focused on similar research questions. It's also a testament to our commitment to interdisciplinary education that our new hires include both scientists and policy experts. In order to be a campus of collaboration, we need to talk across disciplines, bringing scientists and engineers together with humanities, with social science professors, with, and, and those with environmental interests. That leads me to the new Environmental Humanities Initiative in which a core of about 15 faculty members are working on designing a new academic program, most likely a new minor in environmental humanities. This program will be co-directed by McKay Jenkins in English and Adam Rome, another new hire with joint appointments in English and history. By expanding an already enviable slate of environmental majors, we'll develop a pipeline of professionals, academics, engineers, economists, and policymakers who will build on the work we're doing right here and right now and take us further than we can even imagine. And finally, we'll catalyze all these education and research efforts with the Environmental Science and Engineering Laboratory, a state-of-the-art space that will house several of our energy and environmental centers, along with multi-college research groups focused on sustainability science and policy. Today's scientific challenges are complex and require collaboration among people with many types of expertise, a reality not reflected in the design of traditional science and engineering buildings organized by departments. The 194,000 square foot ICE lab is designed to integrate teaching, learning, and research, with the research providing content for the curriculum and students learning through exploration of real world problems. It's the first new laboratory building on our campus in nearly 20 years, and we can't wait to open its doors in the summer of 2013. Until then, we will continue to invest in cross-campus research because we have an absolute imperative to do the interdisciplinary work that will improve the nation's environmental challenges. I thank Denon for taking such a prominent role in reaching out to disciplines across the university and I look forward to more research symposia in which we can continue to build a community that's truly interdisciplinary and university-wide. In the long run, it's only through such cross-discipline collaborations that we will enhance and strengthen our environmental work and thus elevate 
our reputation as an environmental university. Thank you very much and thanks for being here today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our four new cluster hire faculty. Each of them will tell you a little bit about themselves, uh, the types of research they're doing, and hopefully during the course of the day you'll have an opportunity to visit with them and talk about ways that you might be able to collaborate. Our first new hire actually just arrived here last evening from California, Angelia Seiferth will join the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources this spring as Assistant Professor of Plant and Soil Sciences. Angelia received her doctoral degree in Soil and Water Sciences from the University of California at Riverside, and she's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Environmental Earth System Science at Stanford University. Her research interests span the fields of environmental soil chemistry, plant-soil interactions, analytical chemistry, and human toxicology. Angelia, we welcome you to the University of Delaware. Thank you. Um, just take a second. There we go. Find my presentation. Um, <coughs> Thank you um, very much, Don, for that introduction. And I'm very excited to be here. Um, when I came to interview, I met a small number of people who are really great, and I look forward to meeting more of you and talking with you more about, about research and potential collaborative uh, efforts in the future. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, toxic compounds in our food and basically the, the soil and uh, plant physiological factors that would influence how toxic compounds get into our food. If we think, if we step back and think about some of the challenges that we face, um, environmental challenges, uh, arguably among the, the, the top ones, um, I've chosen three. Uh, global climate change and energy related issues is certainly one, but also uh, the available water and food for a growing population are two other very important um, issues that we should be concerned about. But when we're talking about water and food, um, we shouldn't just think about the, the quantity of water and food, but also the quality. So making sure that we have enough clean water and food to feed a growing population. So I am, I've been doing research on how toxic compounds um, that might be present in irrigation water that then is used to irrigate crop fields or present in soil that through certain processes um, can be released into the soil water and then be available for uptake by plant roots and then be transported to the edible portion of, of crop plants that we consume, thus being a secondary route of exposure to contaminants. Let's see if this works. Okay, so um, one of the sort of hot topics right now in this area is arsenic. And I know uh, Dr. Oz had something about arsenic and apple juice, and a lot of people have been asking me questions about that. Um, arsenic is a toxic compound. It's, uh, it's present naturally in the environment, and it's also, um, it's also produced, or uh, it's also released anthropogenically, but, but much of the contamination that we've been hearing about is actually naturally produced. And an area where um, this is very prevalent is in South and Southeast Asia. Um, arsenic causes, uh, is, a, is a known carcinogen and also ca causes other types of 
of ailments, um, one of the manifestations of arsenic toxicity is uh, skin lesions, ultimately leading to skin cancer and also lung cancer and other types of cancers. In South and Southeast Asia, um, the area is being, uh, the, the Himalayas are basically draining into the whole region. And in the Himalayas, there are natural arsenic bearing minerals. As those minerals are deposited into the floodplains and over geologic time they get buried and through certain processes that are currently being investigated can be released into groundwater. And what's been happening over the past about 30 years, people have been trying to increase the, the drinking water supply by tapping those, those groundwater resources when they didn't realize that they were contaminated with arsenic. So this whole region, um, there are estimates of about 100 million people that are being exposed to arsenic through drinking water. And predominantly, uh, we hear a lot about Bangladesh. Um, it's not to say that some of these other countries aren't as uh, impacted, but that there's just so many more people living in Bangladesh um, that there, there are a lot more Bangladeshis exposed to arsenic. But this problem is widespread throughout Southeast Asia. If we think about global rice production, it turns out that most of the rice is, ir is grown in South and Southeast Asia and under irrigated conditions. And that's also the area that's impacted by arsenic and groundwater. So what, I'm what I've been studying for a few years is how, and, and many other researchers, how arsenic that's present either in the groundwater that's being pumped up to use for irrigation or even if um, rain-fed irrigation is being used, if the arsenic is being released from the soil, taken up into the plants, stored in the grain that is being consumed, and thus a secondary route of exposure, in addition to what might be coming through drinking water. So tackling these issues really requires um, a broad, uh, a, an interdisciplinary approach to this, this type of research um, because arsenic it, uh, through certain soil processes, which I'll talk about in a moment, arsenic can be released uh, from soil. And also, there are plant physiological processes that um, influence how much arsenic is being taken up into the plant. And ultimately, we have to think about toxicology as well, how much of that arsenic is, is going to actually impact uh, humans and cause ill effects. So my research is somewhere in the middle between these, these three fields. So I'll talk briefly about the soil processes that govern arsenic movement in rice paddies. If we just think about soil in, an, in a non-flooded environment, um, if we were to go out and dig soil around here, we would find arsenic in the soil. And if we zoom in on some of those soil particles, we might have iron, iron minerals or, or other soil minerals where arsenic is locked up in an immobile form um, on the iron mineral. But when, these, when soils are flooded, like in flooded rice paddy um, agriculture, the iron oxides can reductively dissolve through biological processes, releasing iron, reduced iron to the solution, and any adsorbed arsenic that was on the solid is now released into solution, can be taken up by, by plant roots, and also the oxidized form of arsenic can be reduced to arsenic-3, which is more mobile um, in soil environments. And so the process of flooding rice paddies makes arsenic more available to plants, uh, more so than you would find in other agricultural systems, simply because it's grown under flooded environments. If we now look at what's happening at the root uh, interface, the soil root interface, I'm zooming in now on um, I think this is a pointer. Oh. This would be the rhizosphere, the area just adjacent to the root, and this would be the front of the root cell. And um, this would be the outside of the root going inward. Now, one process that is um, really interesting for aquatic plants like rice is that if they're grown in flood environments, they, the roots still need to respire. They still need oxygen to breathe. So um, rice plants have evolved a way to bring oxygen down, uh, oops, down through, from the air into the roots 
But as a consequence of this, some of that oxygen can leak out. And as it leaks out, it can interact with reduced forms of iron that are um, in the rhizosphere and moving toward the root through just mass water flux or transpiration and precipitate again as the iron oxide where arsenic can sorb to. So this is a, a, an important process that can restrict the amount of arsenic that can be taken up into the plants. My, um, some previous research that I've done has shown that, that this iron plaque is not actually coating all of the roots, that it coats certain portions of the roots. And so there are areas where arsenic can freely have access to the roots. And in those areas, um, arsenic can be taken up into root cells because of chemical similarities with other nutrients that the plant needs. So in the case of the most common arsenic compound in rice patties, in flooded rice patties, arsenic-3, the reduced form, is chemically similar to silicon or silicic acid. And so it can be taken up into rice through that process. Similarly, um, arsenic-5, the, the oxidized form of arsenic, looks very similar to phosphate and can be taken up through phosphate transport proteins. Um, so, so both of these, so all of these factors, if you think about the, what influences arsenic entry into the roots and ultimately into the grain, will involve um, not only what's happening in the rhizosphere, um, but also what, what the plants are doing. And different varieties of plants behave differently. They, they exude different amounts of oxygen into the rhizosphere, um, influencing how much iron plaque can form. They have different expressions of, of, of proteins that will transport um, either arsenic-5 or arsenic-3 into the cell. So all of these factors and, um, need to be taken into account when we think about the con when we try to predict what kind of concentrations we would see in the plant. So what I've done here is I've compi compiled a bunch of market surveys that have been done. Um, all of these uh, numbers here have been published in various studies. Um, we have grain arsenic concentration on the y-axis and different countries where these uh, rice samples were taken. And I, I've plotted the maximum and minimum amounts that were presented as well as the average, um, the average shown in yellow. Um, so these are just numbers. But what do these numbers mean in terms of human health? Um, so what I've done here is plotted, is, is calculated what would be the, the amount of arsenic in the rice if we were at 100% of what the World Health Organization says we can, we can safely consume in a day? And that's what those yellow lines represent. Um, I've done the calculation based on a typical Cambodian diet where you'd eat rice three times a day. Um, and according to World Health Organization um, standards, as well as um, EPA standards. So this would be a typical, oops, typical US diet, maybe rice one time a day based on our, our standards. And down here you'll see that these are all actually uh, rice from the US. So the averages in yellow, we are, we are, we can be <laughs> consuming more uh, arsenic in rice, not even considering what is coming from drinking water. So it's something that we really should be thinking about. How much are we getting exposed, not just through drinking water, but through our food products? So if we, if we then think about, well, what can we do to try to mitigate this issue, we first need to really understand how the arsenic is taken up into the, into the roots. And that's something that I've been working on and, and want to continue to work on uh, when I get to Delaware. Uh, one of the things that I've been really interested in is using uh, imaging techniques like X-ray absorption spectro spectroscopy and fluorescence to understand how, where arsenic and what species are being taken up into the plants. So if we, again, think about a root section, um, keep in mind that, that the root, as it's growing downward into the soil, has different stages of development. And so if we were to take cross sections here, um, down toward the tips, these areas might be important for unregulated arsenic entry. And the reason for that is because arsenic-3 and silicon are taken up in the same process, the silicon transporters are located on what's called a Casparian strip, or this area that um, regulates how much, how much silicon or other, other compounds can be taken up into the root. And that's 
they're located on these areas indicated in black here. Down toward the tip, those areas don't exist, or I'm sorry, the, the Casparian bands don't exist, we know that. So I would hypothesize that um, in that area we might find more absorption of arsenic in an unregulated way. And I have some evidence for this using um, transmission X-ray microscopy shown here where the dark areas in the root tip indicate um, a more abundance of heavier elements like iron and arsenic. And recently I've been looking at this in terms using X-ray fluorescence imaging. And if we, this is a, a root here, um, basically by probing different energies, we can get a more or less a, a, a chemical photograph of elements in the root. And here I'm showing um, iron as well as arsenic. And if we zoom in now on the root tip, and we can probe different energies to get not only different elements, but also different arsenic species, we can see that arsenic-3 seems to be taken up more in this root tip area. So this is something that I want to explore further. If we can take sections of these and couple um, these x-ray techniques with more traditional um, staining techniques to find out where the arsenic is being taken up into the plants. Another area that, um, that I'm interested in exploring is, is how can we decrease the arsenic uptake in the field um, based on the fact that arsenic-3 and silicon are taken up in the same transport process. So the idea is that if we add enough silicon to the soil, it might decrease the amount of arsenic that's taken up and ultimately reduce the, the effect on human health. And silicon is not usually considered um, in fertilizer applications. It's always NPK, NPK. And, and part of that is that silicon isn't considered a plant essential nutrient. However, uh, monocots, grasses, including rice, um, can have up to 10% of their dry matter as silicon. And it's been shown to increase yield in sugarcane and rice in uh, silicon poor soils, and it's also shown to have disease resistance. Also, it's um, been recently shown in the last few years that in, as silicon increases in soil solution, the arsenic in grains here tends to decrease. So if we think about in Southeast Asia where much of the rice is grown, you know, having a synthetic fertilizer is not usually feasible for many people. Um, however, driving around Cambodia, I will tell you that there are tremendous piles of rice straw and rice husk that might be used for, for fuel or for animal fodder, um, but ultimately are being removed from the field and it, they represent a huge source of silicon that might be able to be put back onto the fields and increase the amount of silicon in the soil, which would not only help yields, but also potentially decrease the amount of, of arsenic that's in the grains. And um, I've been looking at this in the laboratory um, with several varieties of rice in several soil environments by having um, a silicon source that's similar to, to what would be coming from plants. Uh, as well as a diatomaceous earth, another type of biogenic silica source. And in all the cases that I've studied, um, in, in these two, two varieties of rice and two different soil types, in all cases, the grain arsenic concentrations significantly decrease um, with added silicon. So this seems like it could be a viable um, solution that I'd like to explore further in the field. And then the last thing I'll talk about is um, just understanding these soil factors that we know uh, influence arsenic uptake uh, in rice and uh, understanding more about how those play into the field environment. Um, so this is a map of Cambodia where I've just started to do some, uh, some, some field research. And this is the arsenic risk in red um, in groundwater. And the Mekong River I'll, it comes in through here, through this way, and then goes out to Vietnam here. And that's, that's the river source that's transporting a lot of the arsenic into the groundwater. Um, if, you, if we then think about where the rice is grown, it tends to be in the floodplains. Um, so, so there are areas where rice is grown, and the people might be uh, exposed to arsenic in groundwater in that area. So I've started, um, I'm going to show you just a, a little bit of data from the, the 
some sites in this white box, but just to let you know that we've started doing um, sampling all around this country, and I'm hoping to get a more countrywide uh, representation of the arsenic in the rice in Cambodia. And here are just the, the, the study locations. Um, the Mekong River in blue coming through this way, and this is the Basak River coming here and Phnom Penh um, right here. And so here's just some of the data. Um, on, on the x-axis are the sample locations, and the y-axis is total grain arsenic, or total arsenic in either the grain, husk, or straw. And all I want to point out here is that it's variable. And this can be due to some of the things I talked about previously. Um, one thing to note is that not all of these plant samples are the same variety, and variety can have a big impact on, on the amount of arsenic that gets taken up. Um, as well as soil conditions. So what, we're, what I'm trying to do is couple the soil properties, the, the available arsenic, the available silicon, with some of the plant varieties. And by getting a larger sample size, I'm hoping that we can start grouping varieties together and, and tease out some of the processes that are happening in the field. But what do these concentrations mean, again, in terms of human health? Because that's ultimately what we're concerned about. So here, what I plotted is just the grain arsenic concentrations in terms of what the World Health Organization says is the um, allowable arsenic intake for the day. And so you can see that these concentrations range from about 20% of your daily allowable intake to about 80%. Um, if we then think about the fact that in Cambodia, the arsenic uh, standard in drinking water is 50 part per billion, where here it's 10. So there's many areas in this study site that, are cons that people are consuming this groundwater because it's safe. So if we then plot the contribution from drinking water at 50 part per billion arsenic, we can see this line here is at 100%. Um, many people are exceeding, maybe exceeding, or very close to 100% of their, their daily allowable intake. And just to point out that if this were US standards, this would be 350 to 600% of what we would consider safe. So there's, there's certainly a lot to be done, um, a lot that, that we can do to try to mitigate this issue in the field, uh, not only for people in Southeast Asia, but for people worldwide, because everybody consumes rice, at least to some degree. Um, but, but doing solving these kinds of issues, again, I'll reiterate what, what we've heard previously, is that um, it's not just going to be what, you know, the processes that are happening in the, in the lab and in the field, but we really need to take that information and see what's going to be feasible to the farmer, what, can, what the farmer can really do realistically if they're willing to make these changes, and then try to influence policy to, to, to facilitate making these kinds of changes and making it easier for people to do. So um, with that, I just want to acknowledge many people that have helped me, um, including a lot of enthusiastic um, high school students and undergraduate students that have helped me in the field, um, and to thank all of you for your attention. Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, so he was asking what, what forms of arsenic um, might be in the, in the roots or in the grains. Uh, the data that I've shown here in terms of concentrations has been total, um, just total arsenic. And that uh, is just done with ICP OES or ICPMS. But for the spectroscopy, um, we can look at different uh, samples at, at different energies that that um, if we probe X-ray energy at slightly different energy levels, arsenic-5, for example, will give a different response than arsenic-3 at those particular energies. So just by doing that, we can, we can then correlate the spectroscopy data with um, some known standards. And by linear combination fitting, we can get a percentage of what might be arsenic-5 versus arsenic-3 in the plants. Other people can, um, have been doing, and I, and I hope to do that when I get here, um, to do speciation 
in the plant samples using um, HPLC coupled to ma mass spectrometry. But yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. That's something I would like to do, but I haven't done it so far. Yeah. That's, that's, that's another excellent point, and that's why um, not only the straw is something that we should look at, but also the husk. So the husk has um, a very low amount of arsenic, but also a high amount of silicon. So the husk might end up being better than the straw. The straw would be potentially, if there's arsenic in the straw, could potentially be released, but there are, there are areas of Cambodia, for example, where there's very low arsenic in the plant where you might be able to take that straw and bring it to a part of the country where arsenic is, is very high in concentration. So it would kind of, it would really depend on more of a local level of what could be, what could be done in terms of straw, but, but you're, you have an excellent point. In that case, the husk might be, might be better because it has lower arsenic levels than the straw. Okay, thanks. So I'm also now pleased to introduce Rodrigo Vargas, who will uh, join the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources this spring also as Assistant Professor of Plant and Soil Sciences. Rodrigo received his doctoral degree in environmental science from the University of California, Riverside, and has recently completed post uh, postdoctoral research at the University of California, Berkeley. Rodrigo's research focuses on how biophysical factors regulate carbon and water dynamics in terrestrial ecosystems. Rodrigo, welcome. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to uh, acknowledge um, first uh, the opportunity to join UD and also the opportunity to share my research with you this morning. Um, the motivation of my research comes from these well-known graphs, where is uh, uh, the change of carb concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through time in the history of Earth. We have seen that there's a lot of variability of CO2 in the atmosphere. However, as we know, um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere lately has increased exponentially. For if we zoom in in this part of the graph and we come to this, uh, to this panel, is the Mauna Loa CO2 series, where we see the uh, exponential increase of CO2, where uh, this year we are in almost 390 parts per million in the atmosphere. So the point from this graph is that we have seen a chemical change in the atmosphere, the chemical, com uh, change in the, uh, com chemical composition in the atmosphere, where uh, in our lifetime, we have seen this, in this rise. Um, also, in addition, in addition with this, we see a temperature increase in the uh, global sulfur uh, temperature. And uh, the biggest challenge that we face now is that uh, we have an uncertainty on the prediction of how, which is going to be the pattern of, uh, of the temperature increase in the near future. However, we have to think about how are we going to adapt a society to these changes and also how the environment are going to, the environmental changes are going to be uh, related to this change in temperature. Specifically, I focus on CO2 and water fluxes. And um, a big challenge on CO2 is to model the feedbacks because we, uh, we, we, uh, we would like to predict which will be the response in CO2 concentrations, but also in the CO2 effect on the environment and we have to consider the feedbacks on this, on this, uh, on this, on this, uh, on this dynamics. Here's a paper uh, published by uh, Hyman and Reinstein in uh, Nature, uh, where they express these feedback loops that they see in the in the, at the, at, uh, in the in the world. Here, I just want to point out in this one for as an example, where we have an increase in CO2 concentration will lead to an increase in air temperature that will in turn lead an increase in soil temperature, 
and this will lead an increase in uh, the soil uh, thawing depth, will increase microbial activity and heat production, then in turn will increase soil temperature and the release of CO2 and so on. Other examples could be in terms of precipitation and the relationship with CO2, but also the relationship of CO2 with photosynthesis and nutrient cycling. So it's just to point out the complexity and the feedbacks in, this, in, this, uh, in, the, in the carbon cycle. Um, if I have to define a question on, about my research, it will be summarized on this one. How biophysical processes regulate the terrestrial fluxes of water and carbon? However, lately I have been uh, uh, interested in coastal ecosystems, but I'm not going to talk about this today. And I think this is important because we need to understand the mechanisms that regulate these fluxes in order to develop elemental equations, to integrate them in mathematical models to predict what is going to happen in the future. My research spans from seconds to decades and from meters to kilometers. I try to understand processes that happen at the plant level, at the ecosystem level, and at the regional scale. I try to move from meters to kilometers and upscaling for prediction, but also downscaling for verification. We may have applied models at the larger scale, but we would like to verify what they're doing at the local scale, if they are getting the right numbers for the right reason. I will point to three examples of each one of these levels. Let me start with the plant level. And one question that I'm interested in uh, is about how plants survive under extreme environments or after extreme events, how they do it. And um, after extreme events, let's say hurricanes or drought, plants survive. So why, how they do it? And um, I have explored these too, but today I'm only going to talk about drought. Um, we can argue that plants, like us, would have carbonate storage. But we don't know where they are, uh, where are they located, and how old are these storage. So plants may be able to store carbon above ground, no? in the leaves, in the, in the branches, in the trunk, but also below ground. We don't know how old, for how long this storage can be, can, can, can be kept. Are we talking about just a few years that the plant can store these reserves, or we're talking about decades that they can, they can store carbon? And then why and how they can allocate these reserves to, uh, to produce new structures. So today I'm going to talk about um, plants, uh, long-lived plants in deserts. So these are, this is an, an ongoing experiment in the desert of Baja California with long-lived plants. Uh, this is a cactus and these are two palms. And these plants can live up to 300 years. The plants that we're using have about 150 years to 200 years. And um, what we, what we, for this specific data, what I'm showing is the production of new roots. So these are very old plants living in extreme environments, no water, and they're producing roots under these conditions. Um, we're using radiocarbon to date the age of these roots. So we would, we would expect that if I have a new root, they, the, common, the common knowledge would tell me that, that uh, it will be due for recent photosynthesis, recent carbon that I will fix, and, uh, and I will produce that root, okay? So this line here, this baseline, is the uh, atmospheric seal, um, uh, radiocarbon signature of this of last year, and uh, the, co the, the columns represent the value of the radiocarbon in the roots. As you see, the value of, of radiocarbon is higher than the baseline of the atmosphere, which can be interpreted as these plants were using older carbon to produce these new roots. The point here is that these plants can store carbon. We don't know exactly where we're, 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 we're investigating that and they can allocate this stored carbon, this reserve carbon that could be 10 years old for production of new structures. So this experiment is continuing to figure out where are these reserves, how old are these reserves, and hopefully when these plants use these reserves. I will move uh, quickly to the ecosystem level. And I want to point out, um, to, I want to uh, bring your attention to this uh, part of the world, the southeast of the United States and the northwest part of Mexico, because uh, the model examples uh, suggest that these are areas for uh, hotspots for climate change uh, in this region of the world. These regions are arid ecosystems, and other ecosystems are sensitive to precipitation. So since the early 70s, uh, Normair proposed that the pattern of the pulses, the frequency and the magnitude of the pulsing precipitation, will regulate the ecosystem dynamics. So if we have uh, uh, isolated pulses, we have uh, discrete responses. The pulses, water pulses may be together, will be, be produce a big response, or they be spaced to have a somehow continuous response. 
So what I want to share today is uh, it's, it's, it's this question. How changes in the frequency and intensity of precipitation may influence the ecosystem carbon dynamics in arid ecosystems? To do this, in collaboration with the University of New Mexico, we set an experiment that lasted four years. So it was in a, in a, in a, in a grassland, and we have control plots just receiving the ambient precipitation. The uh, plots that receive multiple small pulses, so ambient plus five millimeter pulses four times a month, and, and, and plots that will receive infrequent large pulses, so just one pulse of 20 millimeters per month. The point here is that these two, these two treatments will receive the same amount of precipitation, but the patterns were, were different. And the experiment was done for two years before a fire, and then two years after a wildfire. This was not planned. Um, the fire came, destroyed all the experiment, and uh, we have to apply for new grants, get new, uh, new, uh, new, uh, new, uh, new equipment, but the the, uh, it became also a, a disturbance experiment. So these are the four-year results, and, um, and this is before the fire and after the fire. Um, the the, the x-axis uh, just represents stress, stress variable. Less stress in this part of the graph, more stress here. And I want to point out two important results here. The first one is, well, there is interannual variability. There were some years, let's say 2007 and 2000 and year, where the stress was different. So this was more stressful year comparing to this one, but also after the fire we have that. We have more stressful year for 2010 and 2000, and, sorry, less stress and more stress uh, during 2011. That's the first thing. We have interannual variability on, uh, on, on weather patterns, but also, and that will be reflected in the stress that the whole ecosystem will, will, uh, will, will, will have. Now, how the treatment responded? And uh, the, res the, the results were consistent among years and also before and after the fire. And I want to point out that the infrequent large pulses, the triangles, were always higher in, the, in all, during all the years. So how this can be interpreted is that these infrequent pulses were able to water, the, to moist the, the soil and change some, and trigger some um, soil processes with microbes and also within the rhizosphere of the plants to increase carbon release from soils. So this is a, this is a unit of, uh, of, uh, of a carbon release that uh, would go up to, uh, let's say, 100 grams of carbon per meter square. Um, now we are continuing this experiment to pinpoint out which are the mechanisms that actually are triggered. So we have a, a project in review to uh, do watering experiments within the soil depths to um, uh, figure out which are exactly the mechanisms that are triggered uh, within these treatments. Finally, I will move to the regional scale. And here I am interested in how the physical and biological um, uh, processes regulate the patterns that we observe in carbon and water fluxes. Recently, I have also been interested in the social aspects because when we talk about the regional scales, we cross international boundaries. And by moving to these boundaries, we have different politics and different management and missing social um, aspects of how people will um, uh, perceive environmental challenges. I study the water and carbon fluxes using this resource, which is FluxNet, which is a network of networks of eddy covariance towers. What they measure is water and carbon fluxes from the ecosystem uh, uh, using the eddy covariance technique at the ecosystem scale. This network is very well represented in the United States and Europe, but it's less represented in other areas in the world, let's say Mexico and let's say India. For the last year, I have been uh, 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 co coordinating the Mexican regional network of eddy, of eddy covariance towers. At this moment, we only have eight towers around the country, but this network is, is planning to expand. The idea of this network is to start uh, developing the first regional synthesis studies in Mexico, but also use this data to apply ecosystem models to do comparisons across North America, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And hopefully for the next generation of the North American Carbon Program, we can do true synthesis studies across North America. At this moment, we don't have in the synthesis studies information from Mexico, but we are still talking about North America. So the next generation may in, in, uh, include this information, and we are trying to build the resources, the human resources, and also the infrastructure to develop uh, this information, to get this information. This is just one example of the results that we are getting, and these are just modeling results of photosynthesis in terms of a gross primary productivity, um, and the darker colors, the red colors, represent uh, higher photosynthesis rates. Um, here, this is the first uh, map that, developed, uh, that shows photosynthesis in Mexico. 
Matter for the synthesis in, in, in the United States are, 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 are common. In Canada are less common, but they're available. But in Mexico, there's no information about this. So with these first maps, which we need to validate at the site level with the covariance towers, we hope to move towards these true North American synthesis studies. Now, I mentioned that I have been interested in social aspects about regional scale issues. Well, just as a brief example here, um, when my colleague, John Girl Rue, was helping me developing this, uh, these model runs, he saw this part of the map. It's, 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 it's straight lines. And he said, well, there's a, there's a problem in my model. And it's not. This actually is an international border. This is an international border between Mexico and Guatemala. What is happening is the result of politics and deforestation, man management and deforestation, where this is the border, Mexico and Guatemala. More deforestation in Mexico that leads to less photosynthesis and more preserved forest in Guatemala, uh, producing high, well, resulting in higher photosynthesis rates. So we are seeing the effect of, of, of societies in photosynthesis maps at the regional scale. Now, um, I'm, I'm working also on a policy paper because I'm a, I'm a, we have an opportunity in Mexico where carbon cycle science is just starting. But how can we move towards this uh, regional scale without thinking that it's only what is happening within this country? We really need to move at the continental scale what is happening in these three countries. So in this paper, we're producing just uh, we're sharing three main conclusions. The first one is that we need to establish a baseline to understand the, uh, the process and controls governing the carbon dynamics in terrestrial ecosystems. If we are moving towards this regional scale, we need to know what is happening in Canada, the United States, and Mexico, because the climate is different, the carbon pools are different, and the responses of the ecosystems to climate variability will be different, but we don't know what is happening in this regional scale. Second, which is, I think is a very important thing, is to provide a prognostic capability to inform likely trajectories of these processes, given a decision made today. This is very, very important. NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network in the United States, is moving toward these goals, and that's a very important value-added product. Mexico is starting to uh, uh, develop RENOA, which is a very modest version of NEON, but we're pushing to, uh, the, to the organizers to think about these value-added products. And finally, we need to develop a continental scale development and resources towards a tri-national research infrastructure and education network to build the human resources to provide information to truly do an integrative studies in the next generation of uh, North American studies. And with this, I just want to thank you and thank all my collaborators that have uh, contributed to the work that I presented today. Thank you very much. So, so the question is in the radiocarbon data that I presented, um, the roots uh, have higher uh, radiocarbon signature than the one in the atmosphere. The way that is interpreted is um, we're using the, radio, uh, the bomb carbon, the radiocarbon that was produced during um, the, uh, the atomic bombs uh, testing. So in the 60s, the signature in the atmosphere increased, and then it has been decaying. So right now we are around 30 um, uh, delta uh, 13 C. So if, if, if you find something that is higher than that, uh, you would expect that the plants fixed that carbon, so they took the signature that will be higher. And that is how we interpreted that, that the roots have a higher signature and may be using older carbon for that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. I'm now pleased to introduce uh, Christina Archer, who is Associate Professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. Christina previously held positions at California State University and at Stanford University. She received her doctoral degree in civil and environmental engineering from Stanford, and her research interests include renewable energy, climate change, air quality, and numerical modeling of the atmosphere. Christina, welcome.
Thank you very much for the introduction, Don, and thank you, uh, everybody, for inviting me here today, and uh, uh, welcome and good morning. Um, in brief, my, my research uh, passion is in wind power, among other things, and so I've decided today to focus on wind power uh, for my presentation. And I've divided my talk into um, past and current research uh, to show the interesting topics I've been working on, and uh, also I want to mention some of the future research topics that I would like to explore uh, while at the University of Delaware. Um, and so, in brief, um, I've been focus focusing on understanding how much wind power can humanity really tap into. And also, I've been working on the intermittency or variability of wind. That is a big issue, so how can we ameliorate that? Um, and then uh, there's my favorite topic, which is airborne wind energy. So turbines that are actually floating in the air rather than being ground-based. And uh, this is really neat. Um, so let's get going with the first topic, which is these bottom-up methods to understanding the wind power potential. Um, this is work that I've done back in 2003 and 2005 to start off from the existing network of wind speed uh, data that are measured at stations and uh, try to understand how much, um, so this is ground-based, so it's at about 10 meters from the ground, but what we wanna know is how much is the wind at 80 meters from the ground? That's where the hub of the turbine is. And so you need to work on the stability of the atmosphere, how is the wind shear, all kinds of neat meteorological parameters to determine a map like this, which at that time was the first map on 80 meter winds, um, and we did this for the entire world. I'm only showing you the US in, in this uh, map. And the colors are such that uh, uh, the darkest colors are the ones, uh, are the locations with the best potential for wind. These are class three or higher wind locations. So very good for installing wind turbines. And the rest are maybe less promising for, for those applications. So we started off with a lot of data cr crunching. And uh, we discovered that uh, about 13% of the land worldwide, on average, uh, is sufficiently windy to actually make it feasible to have a wind, wind farm there. Um, and so we started to go from, from all these potential locations to how much could we possibly extract if we did install wind farms at all those locations. And that ends up being this number, 72 terawatts. T, T uh, for tera, that's 10 to the 12 watts. Um, as a comparison, the current electricity demand worldwide from all nations is about two, two terawatts. So the potential at uh, 80 meters is already uh, some 35 times uh, higher than all electricity needs worldwide. So very promising result. This was based on observations, but I'm also currently working on some numerical simulations. So now, it, it, how do we fill data voids? How do we uh, get the potential in locations where there are not very many observations as there were in the US, which is a very lucky location with lot, lots of data? And so these are some preliminary results from runs at the global scale, uh, in which the, the neat thing is that we were able to introduce an actual uh, wind power curve from an existing turbine. This is a five megawatt uh, uh, turbine that is a relatively new one. Five megawatts, this is a really tall turbine. Um, uh, that, that we put into the code directly to get the actual output uh, every time step of the model. And this is one of the maps that we're generating where I'm only highlighting the best locations with the capacity factor, which is basically uh, what, what fraction of the, of the power of the turbine can actually um, produce wind. Um, and so these are only the best locations worldwide. And again, there, there, there are very many areas where, where there is enough wind to, to uh, install a farm. Um, the neat thing about having a model is that you can actually look at, uh, uh, first of all, locations everywhere, and then look at the seasonal uh, variability of the wind. So remember, I had found 70, 72 terawatts on average from observations. Now from the model, we discovered that there's actually a pretty large variability between what happens in the summer. The global resource worldwide is actually lower. Uh, so summer here, winter here. A very large variability in the resource availability. So the highest, uh, the best uh, producing months worldwide are actually during the northern hemisphere winter. 
we, which makes sense uh, now that I've seen the result, obviously. It makes sense because of the great uh, land extension, uh, the, the greater uh, land area uh, in the northern hemisphere than in the, in the southern hemisphere. So the northern hemisphere uh, dominates in this case. And so even including system losses, uh, inefficiencies, wake effects, transmission losses, counting about 12.5% of, of, uh, of the uh, power, we still uh, obtain some 70 to 100, 180 terawatts of power at the global scale. So some, some 100 terawatts of availability is a good number to remember. Um, but again, this is on average. What about the variability of the wind? What about the fact that uh, uh, one hour, this is a, a week of data in, in, in the US at a windy location, Within one week, you can go from very low wind to very high wind within uh, 24 hours or so. And if that's not bad enough, uh, the power, so that was wind speed. What about the power that you can extract? Because there's a V to the third relationship, wind power is actually even more variable. So things get actually worse. So at the same location, the power can actually go from zero, no production. There's not enough wind to spin the blades to maximum production within a few hours. And you can even do this up and down uh, several times in a day. So you, you don't want your electricity to do this in your house, right? Oops, I'm, I'm submitting my thesis. Oops, it's gone. <laughs> you, know, you don't want that. Um, so I've been looking at one simple way to mitigate this problem, which is the idea that, OK, maybe it's not windy here today, right now, but maybe it is windy today at a location nearby. And so I've been exploring those anti-correlation or correlation, correlations between locations. And I've looked at an array, an hypothetical, hypothetical array of 19 locations in the, in the Midwest. And I've looked at what happens if I actually have a, I, I want to call it like a super grid or a super entity. So the, the wind farms, instead of producing power and selling it as, as a, each by itself, they actually get together and, and sold their power as an entity. So you would get uh, some, uh, some benefits by doing that because this would be what the power output from one location would be once you rearrange it in such a way that it's in decreasing order throughout a year. So you can quickly see that, okay, for some 15% of the time, I get 1,500 kilowatts, one and a half megawatts from this one and a half megawatt turbine. But the bad news is that for another about 15% of the time, I get zero. Uh, but look at this. If you just put seven sites together, things are starting to look better. Uh, you have only a few hours during a year with no production. And if you actually have 19 sites, then you have no hours with no production. So at the expense, obviously, of, of having less times with full production. So this is a simple finding, but it's very interesting because 90% uh, of the time, which is the average reliability of a coal power plant, 90% of the time, you now have a non-zero power that you can guarantee. This is about, you know, if you prolong this line 90 and you go here, it's about 200 kilowatts that are base load they can be guaranteed at the same reliability as that of a coal power plant. So very, very important result. And what happens in terms of smoothing is that uh, the power, you remember that going up and down has kind of, has been mitigated and now the black line which, which represents the output from all 19 sites is much smoother. Those uh, big intermittent uh, events have been mitigated you still get times when there's no wind, even in such a large re region. So this doesn't take the variability away, but it makes the standard deviation much less. So you have a, a smaller amplitude of the variation of the, of the output. So very good. Another uh, mechanism that you can use to smooth and uh, uh, reduce this variability is actually compressed air energy storage which is the idea of using an underground reservoir, an existing geological reservoir, to actually store compressed air. So what you do is, here's your wind turbine at night. Say you have excess wind that nobody's using. Well, use that electricity to uh, compress air, store it underground, and then later in the day, in the afternoon, when there's a high demand for electricity but not much wind, you release that air uh, back you still use, use some natural gas or, or um, another traditional turbine. So this is not a carbon-free source, but it uses much less carbon, and you produce electricity via a traditional turbine. So that way, you've basically um, made the variability uh, 
reduced, basically. You've, you've reduced the variability. So we just got a paper out uh, this month about this, and we had a very uh, uh, difficult task. We wanted to guarantee uh, 400 megawatts, 90% of the hours in a year, but 100% of the times during the critical demand times. So peak afternoon hours in the afternoon and uh, peak demand hours in the winter. And with this case system, compressed air energy storage, we were able to actually achieve that even more. So um, with wind alone, we would have had this red line, so 400 megawatts only, let's say, 50% of the time. But with the addition of the case, now we're in the yellow line, where we are able to produce 400 megawatts for actually more than our objective of 90%. So the, this was very uh, exciting. And on top of that, even though this system is expensive, um, it, it's also the one with the lowest CO2 emissions and uh, the lowest fuel consumption than the other two that we compared it against, which were natural gas and, and coal. Um, airborne wind, wind energy is, um, um, as again, this idea of having floating turbines in the air. So there's a lot of wind near the ground, but guess what? The higher you go, the more the wind. And so I've tried to quantify how much more really is there, because as you go upper in the atmosphere, the air is thinner. So yeah, there's more wind, but there's less mass that actually can drive the turbines. So you have to take both factors into account. And here um, we analyze the wind power density. This wind power density takes the air density into account of uh, the global resource at 80 meters, traditional ground-based wind, versus 10 kilometers. So this is the jet stream level. I'm talking about 30,000 feet from the ground. And I'm comparing these kilowatts per square meter at various percentiles. Um, but so this is like uh, what happens 50% of the time, 68% of the time, and 95% of the time. The point being that uh, the greener the, the color you see, the more this wind power density. And there's basically no green at 80 meters, even at 50% uh, uh, reliability. But uh, there's a lot of green uh, up in, in the jets. And the, the, the jet streams are especially strong in, uh, uh, on top of Japan and in the uh, eastern side of the United States. So you can actually look at this, this density in detail as a function of height. And this is for New York, which happens to be an amazing place for, for uh, such applications. And so you can see how at uh, 9 kilometers, 50% of the time, you get 8 kilowatts per square meter. Whereas at about uh, 80 meters or 100 meters from the ground, maybe you get a half. So you can get 20 times more energy if you can put your turbine higher than you would from the same turbine being near the ground. So there's a 20 uh, factor that you can, you can count on just by if you can reach it, obviously, which is the challenge. How can you do that? Well, it's not as crazy as it, as it may sound to you. There are plenty of uh, startup companies and companies that uh, are, are actually doing it. Uh, these are just some examples. Uh, Magen has a helium-filled balloon that reaches maybe 300, 400 meters. Skywind Power, they want to go to the jet streams. Uh, Joby Energy, uh, Intermediate Heights, and this is an Italian company in Torino, uh, KiteGen. And um, um, I, I, I really, uh, I contributed in a sense to this, to this technology because I organized the first conference in Chico, my previous institution, uh, on, on high altitude wind power. And uh, at that point in November 2009, these people had never spoken with one another. Competition was fierce. They hated each other. They wouldn't even, had show, had, they wouldn't even show a plot of their devices to one another. They got together, discovered all the common goals that they shared and the common uh, uh, obstacles that they needed to overcome. And uh, within uh, six months, Stanford organized uh, uh, another conference, which had twice as many attendants. And then last year, uh, it was organized in Europe. And it will continue year after year. And uh, so this is a success story, in a sense. Um, in terms of future, um, the most interesting thing I'm, I'm working on is to look at wind potential, not much from these uh, bottom-up methods, but by looking at uh, what's the climatic impact of wind. And maybe the answer to how much wind we really can tap is how much wind is actually safe in terms of, of climate effects. 
And so we did some simulations of scenarios, and again, I wanna say these are not realistic predictions because as I start telling you what we've, we've done, you're gonna say, oh, this is crazy. But it's to bound, basically, the problem. Uh, we put uh, turbines everywhere, everywhere in the atmosphere, over the oceans, at all levels, all the way up to the troposphere at constant intervals. So we gave a big push to the climate, as you can imagine. Um, we looked at increasing densities of these devices. What if we put one turbine? What if we put 100? What if we put 10,000 of them? So we did three scenarios. We extracted kinetic energy from all these levels of the model uh, with perfect efficiency. For lack of a better number, I used perfect efficiency. Uh, no energy losses, so all that energy is extracted, becomes electricity, is taken to the ground by the tethers, is converted to heat eventually by end users, and we ran, we ran 70 years, and I'm gonna show you results from 30 years, and they're very boring, very boring. This is the 30-year uh, average uh, temperature change at the global scale from this massive penetration of wind turbines in the entire atmosphere. This is the lowest density uh, type of scenario with one square meter per kilometer cube of atmosphere, and with that, we extracted about 18 terawatts. Remember, two is the current uh, electricity demand. So we still extracted plenty to power humanity. And, and the the, the, there was basically not, not a significant effect on the climate. Technically speaking, it was a cooling by 0 0.04 degrees. So if anything, it was a very slight cooling. And it, I don't have a plot of the sea ice extent, but it did increase a little bit. Um, and then we tried 100 meters per square, uh, 100 square meter per cubic kilometer, and now we extracted an insane amount of energy, 840 terawatts. I don't know. I hope we'll never need that. It's it's a very high amount of energy, and now we did see some climate impacts, uh, mostly cooling by minus 2.2 degrees on average uh, at the surface, localized areas of warming, um, and then we we can actually look at. Uh, so let's plot, let's plot these final results. And I only have three points. And so as a function of the turbine density, how much power can we generate? And so one, one, cubic, one turbine, basically one of these small devices per kilometer cube in the atmosphere yields about 18 terawatts at basically no climate effect. But if you then multiply by 100 the number of turbines, it's non-linear. You don't get 100 times more power. You get only about 50 times more power. And then if you go even 100 times more, then you only double the amount of power. So the important uh, uh, finding here is that there seems to be some kind of a saturation effect. At one point, the atmosphere is not going to let you generate more. There's, there's some balances that, 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 that start. And also, the real question might be, so which one of these cooling effects are we going to accept? I don't want a world that is 9.6 degrees cooler. So perhaps the interesting thing is that the amount of power we can extract is actually something that we can decide is how much we're willing to take, basically, in terms of climate consequences. So again, it becomes a, maybe a political decision rather than a physical one. And uh, I'm going to skip this. And I also have another proposal out to try to study, again, the variability of wind. But this time the question is, maybe I don't want really the wind power output to be base load, to be flat and constant all the time. How about if we try, if we try to match the demand? Maybe that's a much smarter thing to do. Rather, the demand is not flat, so why should the, power be, the wind power be flat? And so the first thing you need to look at, uh, what does the electricity demand look like in the US? And this is what it looks like. This is total electricity in the US in 2006. And it's very beautiful. So many, so much information. So first of all, higher in the summer than in the winter. And if you are careful, you count all these peaks. There's actually uh, 52 of them. So you can identify every week. And you can find 4th of July in here. You can find, find Christmas in here. Because people's behaviors are actually somewhat predictable. Um, so very interesting. You can also, again, rearrange everything in decreasing order. And as opposed to wind, this never goes to zero. <laughs> as you can imagine, the demand never goes to zero. And so the question is, can I perhaps cover this with wind alone? And I don't know if you can, if you can see, but there are little dots here at the locations with the most wind. 
in the US. And so I'm placing hypothetical farms uh, out there and see how much the combined output of all of those would be. And, uh, and this, is, this is what I found. And this is a little hard to interpret. This is actually the fraction of electricity demand up to you know, 1%, 200%, and so on. What, how, how much of that electricity can I cover with wind? So this point, 0 0.5, would mean that I'm covering half of the demand with wind. And so for different scenarios of wind penetration, the black line being 20% uh, and then 40 and 100, so, so this is a certain amount of wind farms that I'm having. For 20% and versus 40%, I've doubled the amount of uh, the number of turbines basically installed. But the problem is that the output is not flat. So it would be nice if that 20% meant at all times I'm covering 20% of the demand. I'm not. I'm basically only covering 20% of the demand one hour a year. Most of the rest of the time, I'm, I'm covering more than what I promised but for some 45% of the time, I'm producing less than what I promised. And so th if these curves were flat, then I would be satisfying always 20% of the demand, but I'm not. And also the problem is that even when I install 100% of wind, which means theoretically, on average, I have enough power to cover the demand, when you go in the hour by hour, you're not. And so you have so much more wind in many hours of the day and a big demand for wind on the other. So what you would want is to find a way to, to put that energy at, at those other times. And so um, a way to do this is to actually combine solar energy and wind energy. And I apologize for not showing you all the steps here, but I just wanted to show you these, these beautiful plots uh, in which I'm combining wind penetration up to 110% and solar thermal, so these are concentrators, not PV, uh, up to 110%. And the colors in here tell you what fraction of the demand am I actually covering on average. And so you can see that without storage in the concentrator, uh, in the solar concentrator plant, uh, the news are bad, so at most you can get this, this nice green, uh, bright, bright green, which is between 90 and 95%. So a point up here means that I've installed 110% of the demand with wind, and I've doubled the installations because I've installed 110% uh, of, of the needs in terms of solar concentrators, and at the end of the year, on average, I only cover 90% of the demand. So it's kind of bad news. Why is that? Because, again, there's a mismatch between the demand and, and, and uh, supply. But with storage, the, so with, with the solar thermal, you can actually store some of the solar energy and use it later. And that's a big uh, game uh, changer because this is zero hour of storage, which was the previous image. By comparison, this is what can I get with just two hours of storage from the solar concentrators? And uh, you can start seeing up here the 99.9% .9 of greater coverage, which is what you want. And things get better and better the more storage you have. And actually with 12 hours of storage, which is still in dreamland uh, uh, right now, technologically speaking, uh, you can actually cover basically 100% of the demand with 60, um, 62.5% wind and 62.5% solar. So this point, which is the optimal, um, corresponds to 125% penetration. So you still had to install a little more turbines and a little more solar panels than you need 25% uh, extra. But then with 12 hours of storage, you can actually cover 99.96% of the demand, which is the current reliability of the electric grid. So really good, uh, good news there. And so I don't have a conclusion slide, but I just uh, am summarizing my research interests up here um, and my email address in case you want to contact me. And uh, thank you very much. Have you looked at wave power? Wave power? Yes, I have. Um, I, I've started to, to look at tidal power, not wave power. Uh, wave power will come, will come in, since I'm in the right department to do that. <laughs> Can you do your calculations to consider how much uh, demand can be met with uh, wind? Do you consider the losses due to transmission to where things are 
Yes, yes, we did. Uh, in a somewhat crude way, we were assuming a certain percent of the energy would be lost to transmission. Um, when I showed some slides with 12.5% uh, system losses, it included transmission. I don't remember exactly what number we use. I would say 7%, but yeah. yeah one oh. question again. Thank you. The, uh, the optimal point that you talked about at the end, uh, having equal mix of wind and solar, I imagine that that's an optimal frontier if the price of solar was less than wind, you'd move up on the curve and an insane amount of assumptions yes and I did not include the price so cost was not uh, was not an assumption there are too many assumptions to to answer quickly but I can I can discuss that later so this is a uh, these are very preliminary results with very crude assumptions and I'm hoping to improve those with a proposal that is actually pending. So they're not final, they're just uh, to show the point. All right, thank you. We have, uh, we have a networking session in a few minutes, so those of you who didn't get to ask questions of Christina, there should be time for you to talk with her. Um, I'm also now very excited to um, invite Andrea Sarzinski to the podium. Andrea is the assistant professor in the School of Public Policy and administration in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she received her doctoral degree in public policy and public administration from George Washington um, University Institute of Public Policy. She previously served as a research professor at George Washington University and was a senior research analyst with the Brookings Institution. Her research interests include environmental and energy policy, patterns of land development and urban sprawl, and state renewable energy policy. Andrea? Good morning. Thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here. I want to thank Denon and the University of Delaware for my hire, of course. I'm um, very excited to have a job here and to be in this, um, in the, uh, the group of the new hires and bringing in more expertise and more interest on environmental topics to the university. Um, and my presentation is going to be somewhat different than the earlier ones because I wanted to give you a, a more of a flavor of the different types of research projects I've worked on in just a summary sense, um, and as well as give you a flavor of what sort of policy scholars bring to some of the uh, environmental research that might be going on at the university. Um, so I joined the university in September, and I'm currently teaching the policy analysis, and in, I'll be teaching a new class in environmental policy in spring. Um, so one of the things that I want to bring to my teaching at Delaware is um, some sort of client-oriented uh, policy projects for students, where they can do a little bit of research, but be um, hopefully working with some folks at DENRAC and some other agencies um, to deliver some interesting policy-relevant findings um, as they're working throughout the semester. So my background, I do have some natural science training and natural resources from Cornell, but um, most of my training is in the social sciences and public policy. But public policy by nature is very interdisciplinary. So we have a lot of studies in economics and statistics and political science and <clears throat> um, so forth. So I feel like they, um, my training is, is very broad and it um, has translated into quite a lot of different research projects that I've worked on. Um, my work history has also been somewhat varied. I've worked in a, in a law firm as a paralegal on more legal side of things. Um, I worked for the White House Council on Environmental Quality on some energy permitting issues and regulation. I taught, I was at Brookings. Um, institution where we looked at um, uh, several different things while I was there, one of which I'll present in a minute. And then most recently I was a research professor at George Washington. And so for the last five years I've been um, project funded, which means uh, quite a lot of different things going on. But I'm going to focus on three topics that uh, I've sort of been working on for multi uh, years now. The first of which is on what I'm calling metropolitan sprawl, not urban sprawl. 
because I believe that patterns of land use um, really, um, in terms of the way they impact the environment, happen more at the metropolitan scale and larger scales than at local scales. Um, but in any case, this is a project that uh, I started working on in 2000 um, with a group of scholars looking at how do we measure patterns of land use and land use change at the metropolitan scale. Um, so in the year 2000, we had very little comparative data across all metropolitan areas on land use patterns. Uh, we had lots of good data on urban densities, for instance, but those uh, average numbers are very uh, unhelpful from a planning and policy perspective. So we wanted to get some more, um, more in-depth data on land use patterns. This was funded by the Fannie Mae Foundation when they were still alive, and um, the US Geological Survey. And this addressed both a planning and um, basic geography interest as well as a broader policy interest, especially on federal transportation and housing policies. What can the federal funding agencies do to encourage sort of smarter growth patterns or, or more um, environmentally sensitive growth through their delivery of federal dollars? Um, so my contribution to this effort has been to analyze the data and do the most recent round of GIS processing in terms of bringing in these um, data sets that we have. This is all US-based, but we uh, were looking at some of the Landsat um, data in terms of land cover, as well as overlaying census data on uh, where housing units were located and overlaying uh, employment data on where jobs were located, um, all of this to get a sense of what's going on within metropolitan areas. But my real interest here is not just developing these sort of land use metrics on, on how do we measure sprawl and, and, and land use change, but um, drilling down on examining its environmental impacts. So now that we have some data on metropolitan patterns of, of land use and how it varies across areas and over time, um, you know, when, where, and why is sprawl bad? We tend to think sprawl's bad, right? Some classes we teach our students sprawl's bad, but sprawl isn't always bad. There are some places where sprawl is worse than others, right? So there's a qualitative dimension on sprawl. And one of the things I wanna know is where are places doing it right and where are they sort of taking what they have on the ground because we can't just rearrange um, you know, the land use just willy-nilly sort of we need to deal with what we have on the ground. Um, so how can we improve environmental quality through, through land use um, and what we have on the ground? So I've looked at so far, traffic and air quality, these are the two primary outcomes I've been focused on. Um, I am mostly a quantitative scholar, so I use a lot of multiple regression, path analysis, factor and cluster analysis um, when I'm looking at these, these large data sets. Um, and our current research agenda is to update and extend this work on traffic and air quality with data through 2010, which we're currently collecting, and add uh, additional impacts on household ener energy use and carbon footprint. So, this I expect to be turning into um, a larger book proposal, and um, we have a proposal into NSF to fund, fund this, we'll see. Um, and the carbon footprint thing I mentioned is the, sort of the second prong of my research agenda. This was originally started, for me at least, at the Brookings Institution. I was project manager for a project where we were trying to get a handle on what are the carbon footprints of cities in the US. Um, this was motivated at the time by the fact that we were in federal climate policy discussions. We were talking about whether we should have some sort of cap and trade policy or something or other that was gonna have really um, real impacts on households and businesses in terms of, of economics and other outcomes, but we had very little data at that time to assess what is that impact gonna be and how could we design policies to minimize impact or, or so forth. So this was motivated by this federal um, discussion, but we, we needed to collect some data. So we contracted with two uh, scholars from Georgia Tech to develop a methodology to measure residential energy use, <coughs> excuse me, and road travel. Um, so this is about half of the carbon footprint from cities. Um, and we co-authored this descriptive report with area rankings and some federal policy recommendations we developed that got really widespread press. So if any of you were curious who is this person who's talking to us and you, you know, Google me, almost all of the sites are gonna come from this, this report we did from Brookings because we, what did we do? We had rankings, 100 of the largest metropolitan areas in the US, you know, what is their carbon footprint? How does it compare? And instantly you're getting people, oh, what, is, what does this look like? How, how do I compare? How does LA compare with Portland, with New York, and so forth? So it was really an interesting project. Um, and we hope at some point to turn around and update the data 
Um, the biggest bang from the buck in terms of this project, I think, was not really on the federal climate policy side, because if you've been paying any attention to climate policy recently, the feds have gotten out of the game, right? Um, not that they were ever really in it. But um, I'd like to say that the value of sort of data production has been important, especially at the local scale. We really generated some um, good buzz from local policymakers who wanted to know how they could do better, how they could get people on board. And so we sort of elevated the discussion, brought them some data, talked about how places compared with other similar places and got, um, got a network of local and regional policymakers engaged in, in discussing um, mitigation policies that could be adopted at the local and, and state level. Um, so now I'm working with a team to measure greenhouse gases from cities globally. Um, our, our point here is that the next round of the International Panel on Climate Change does have a focus more on cities, as it should, because now at least half of the global population is located in cities. So we want to deliver some more policy-relevant data on um, footprints and how places compare and how we could adopt particular policy recommendations that are tailored to um, situations on the ground. So we have developed a somewhat quick and dirty um, database of about 7,000 cities globally. We have data on the four major greenhouse gases um, and six source categories, ag, transportation, residential, energy, and industry, and waste. We currently have the data crunched for 2000 and 2005, although the data set where we're getting our numbers from um, has some older data and should have a new release of, of 2010 fairly soon. Um, our, our interest here is to publish a series of descriptive um, and exploratory papers looking at how carbon footprints vary across cities globally and why a little bit to get a better sense of what's going on. Um, and this is all being fed into this uh, latest round of the IPCC um, discussions, which is, is really exciting. And we're also focusing some of our work now that we have more of a time series component on making some projections into the future under different scenarios. Um, and for this work, we're focusing specifically in Asia, where we expect to have quite a lot of population growth and other um, you know, impacts on the global climate. Uh, related to this, I'm pursuing a parallel effort looking at four major air pollutants, uh, NOx, VOCs, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxide. These are um, you know, important in terms of human health, and especially in some of these big cities. But my personal motivation is to try to identify the best locations where we could attack the climate challenge and the air quality challenge and get sort of the bigger bang from the buck in terms of both. Um, so again, this is uh, policy motivated rather than, than scientifically motivated to some extent. Um, the last thing I want to talk about here is some work that I've been involved with the last couple years that's somewhat different, but a little bit more policy, um, a little, little bit more policy focused, and that is um, state incentives to support solar power. So we just heard about wind power, um, but states are really the front line in terms of supporting and um, encouraging the adoption of solar technologies. But um, up until now, there's been very little comparative research on what states are doing well and what they're getting in terms of the monies that they're investing in solar technology. Um, some places have been investing quite a lot of money per individual installation. Um, and so getting um, really, we're not sure what the return is and what the ideal sort of subsidy uh, arrangements are for states. So this has been looking at what's the field? What are states doing? Just, just in general, what's out there in inventory? Um, then we were looking at tracking adoptions. What have states been doing in terms of their, their um, incentive structures? Are they learning from other states? Are they just designing their own from scratch? How does that interact with the federal policy um, situation? And then we've been starting to dig into this question of effectiveness. We've been trying to look at how much um, energy is being uh, created by these installations that have been supported by public um, money, specifically state money and if there are certain types of state policies that are more effective in generating money um, cheaper, or generating energy from solar technology uh, um, cheaper. So this is an ongoing project, and one of the things now that I'm here at Delaware that I think would be interesting was dig a little deeper at the Mid-Atlantic region, maybe look at all of the Reggie states to see what can be done at a regional level, because of course states are really cash-strapped now. A lot of states are getting out of the subsidy game entirely, they just can't afford it. Um, so maybe we can do something at a more regional level to pool resources and, and drive um, more 
solar power. And of course, the, this project was funded by um, a solar consortium, so their interest was entirely solar when I started the project. But I think there's a lot of potential for looking more broadly at how you can combine solar with some other renewable technologies at the state level, um, and especially on the efficiency side. So uh, a lot of states give out money for solar installations without requiring any sort of improvements on the efficiency side, and I think there's a lot of benefits that could be generated there by focusing our, our scarce public funding on things that are gonna give a bigger, bigger bang, which might be efficiency. Um, so those are three sort of uh, projects I've been working on. And uh, I, of course, encourage collaboration and um, suggestions. And as I mentioned, because I'm hoping to, to start these student-oriented projects, if you have ideas or topics of interest that could be uh, attacked by some uh, advanced undergraduates or graduate students, let me know, and I'll try to work it into my class. Okay, thank you. I would like to hear that too. I, um, since I've gotten here to Delaware, I haven't uh, really gotten down in the nitty gritty of what's going on at the, at the university, but I would hope that we could, we could put you in touch with somebody who knows that information. Okay. Yeah. I was curious what state incentive programs you think are the most effective for doing the job of getting solar power. Good question. So traditionally state incentive programs are um, things like income tax credits, right, or rebate programs. And a lot of the uh, original incentives that were adopted 20 years ago were very, very small and covered sort of upfront cost to some extent. The more innovative programs that have come around recently have um, been performance tied. So if you produce a certain amount of electricity each year from your photovoltaic panels, you get a, either a tax credit or a rebate check for that year based on how much energy you produce. And that's um, sort of happening over time. Usually these are 10 or 15 year long programs. Sometimes they involve an agreement with a utility where you're selling your power directly to the utility, which is using that um, to meet its renewable requirements. And those sort of performance-based incentives in general seem to work a lot better than the original upfront investment incentives in terms of encouraging people to adopt because they are looking at a longer time, time frame in most places. Um, but what I'm finding interesting is places like, you, know, you might have heard, um, I'm, I believe Delaware has gotten into this, but New Jersey and several other states now are um, moving their incentives completely out of the public domain and creating new sort of energy markets where they're encouraging the sale of these um, renewable energy credits, for instance. And those incentives that are tied to renewable energy credits in the private market seem to be working a lot better than the traditional just upfront payment checks you get from the state. So um, it's part of it is the, the structure of the way we're delivering incentives is changing, um, but certain states seem to be doing it a lot better than, than others. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Andrea, so we'll now have a break in that working session and reconvene here at uh, about a quarter of 11. I'm now delighted to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Professor McKay Jenkins, who is the Cornelius A. Tillman Professor of English at the University of Delaware. McKay has been writing about people in the natural world for 25 years. He is the author of five books and editor of an anthology of the work of the American nature writer Peter Matheson. Uh, McKay is a former staff writer for the Atlanta Constitution, and he has also written for Outside, Orion, The New Republic, Salon, and The Huffington Post. McKay holds degrees from Amherst, Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism in Princeton, where he received his PhD in English. And here at Delaware, he directs the journalism program and has been honored with the Excellence in Teaching Award. And so we're very pleased today to have McKay here to discuss his most recent book, What's Gotten Into Us, Staying Healthy in a Toxic World. McKay?
Uh, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. It's uh, incredibly exciting to hear uh, the amount of expertise we have in this room uh, and to imagine that an English professor could be invited to be part of that is really an exciting thing for me. Um, I'm just, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about uh, this field that is called many things. Nature writing is one of them. Uh, I've been doing it for a while uh, for newspapers, magazines, and since I've been here uh, in books, writing books seems to suit me. I really like the, uh, the prospect of spending two or three years writing a single thing instead of uh, you know, 12 hours writing a single thing. Or when I started my newspaper career at the Annapolis newspaper, uh, writing three stories a day uh, every day of the week. You, you don't really get a, you know, enough time to sink your teeth into anything. So these, these are the four more uh, re most recent books that have something to do specifically with nature. The White Death uh, is the true story of five boys that were killed in an avalanche in Montana in 1969. They were trying to make the first winter ascent of the highest mountain in Glacier National Park. Uh, they asked the old school rangers whether they thought it was a good idea. The rangers said it was a bad idea. You know, this is how it goes if you think, uh, uh, you know, in terms of archetypes, right? The old ranger says, don't do it. The young boys do it. Uh, they disappear, and uh, six months later, they're found buried under 20 feet of snow. Uh, it led to one of the biggest search and rescue missions in the history of, of American mountaineering. Uh, so that's the narrative, and in that book is a great deal of science about avalanches, snow science and avalanche science, because for me, uh, you know, the, the, the mystery of what happens to them is just enough to keep you reading, but it gives you uh, an opportunity to talk about science and, and things. Uh, the Last Ridge is a story about World War II, but it's about the 10th Mountain Division, which was the, the uh, United States' first mountain uh, troops. They were uh, recruited from mainly from New England and from the Rocky Mountains. These guys were, at, even before they were soldiers, were world-class skiers and world-class mountaineers who uh, trained in near Vail, Colorado, sometimes uh, doing military uh, exercises at 13,000 feet, uh, then sat and sat and sat and were finally inserted into the war in uh, uh, the Apennine Mountains of Italy towards the end of the war and had some very exciting, uh, daring exploits, climbing a famous mountain called Riva Ridge to take out some uh, Nazi uh, uh, sentry places up there. And I, I mean, I could talk all about that, but we'll do that another time. Uh, the Peter Matheson Reader is, is an anthology of, of Matheson's uh, fabulous uh, nonfiction work. I'm sure many of you know him. Uh, he has become a bit of a mentor to me, as is John McPhee, who I'm sure many of you have been reading for decades, who uh, writes for The New Yorker, writes a bunch of books. And I had the great opportunity to study with him when I was in graduate school. Uh, Bloody Falls of the Copper Mine is the true story of a couple of French Catholic priests who decided to spread the word uh, up to the Arctic. <clears throat> the Catholic Church was racing the Anglican Church to uh, you know, in install churches around Canada uh, right around the turn of the century, and um, they were pushing north, and this was a mission of these two French Catholic missionaries to go up to the Arctic and start to proselytize among Eskimos. Uh, they ended up getting murdered while they were up there, uh, and which led to a fabulously uh, interesting cops and robbers uh, narrative where you had some Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, trying to hunt down the killers on dog sleds, spent two winters looking for these men, uh, finally found them, brought them to trial in Edmonton, which at the time had a population of 11,000 people, uh, and put these Inuit hunters on trial the first time that these Aboriginal Canadians had ever uh, stepped foot in a uh, at the time, a British court. So that, again, is sort of a whodunit kind of story, but it gives an opportunity to talk a lot about anthropology and the clash of these two cultures, one European, one uh, Aboriginal. Um, so the story that I'm going to talk about today uh, is the first time that I've ever had the opportunity in a long-form piece of writing to, to write in the first person. Uh, everything else, you know, I had as a journalist, you have it beaten into you as I continue to beat into my students that uh, the first person is, is uh, off limits, uh, until it's not. Uh, and in my case, it, it, became not, uh, it became not when I, uh, about six years ago, went to see my physician uh, thinking I had some sort of a running injury. And uh, he said, you know, just go ask an orthopedist to give you a quick MRI. We'll figure out what's wrong, and uh, you'll be on your way. So I did that, and uh, the orthopedist called me, after having the MRI, he called me back at uh, 4.59 on a Friday afternoon and said, uh, you have a suspicious mass in your abdomen, and you need to call an oncologist right away. And then he went to play golf, apparently, because he didn't answer the phone when I called him back. Uh, 
And I went into the, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of people in the room who've had this, this feeling of uh, free fall into terror and all that. At the time, my kids were a year and a half old and five. And for about a month, my wife and I uh, were in full panic, uh, running around getting consultations and second opinions and all of this. Uh, ended up on the surgical schedule of a surgeon in New York City. Uh, and I got up in my scrubs and was sitting there in the waiting room with uh, my headphones on and the Dalai Lama like talking to me about the impermanence of life and all that. I was really like getting ready for this big moment. Uh, and that tranquility was ruined by a couple of researchers who came up to me with their clipboards and asked if they could ask me a few questions. And I said, sure. Uh, but, you know, make it short, I got to get back to the Dalai Lama here, you know. And so they started asking these questions and they, they wanted to know about my chemical exposures. And uh, I can't say that I had never thought about that. I certainly had never written about it. I'd never given it a lot of thought. But they started asking question after question. They started with industrial things, like P things I'd heard of, PCBs, for example. But then the question started to move more into, uh, how should we say, more um, mundane or domestic kinds of chemicals and synthetics that go into everyday things that we might come into contact with, like, for example, the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting that we're all sitting on that is, you know, made with stain-resistant chemicals, or the formaldehyde that's in the plywood that wraps this building, uh, or the flame retardants that are used to make the, uh, the cushions in the seats that you're sitting in, for example, or, uh, you know, on and on and on. And these questions went on, dozens and dozens of questions, until my head was spinning. And, I, you know, I said, look, I've had two jobs in my life. I've been a newspaper reporter. I've been a professor. It's not like I've been working in a, in a chemical plant. Uh, but I left this thing uh, with quite a few questions. Uh, then I was you know, taken into this operating room, uh, knocked out, woke up three hours later uh, with my surgeon, my wife smiling at the foot of my bed, and I figured something must have gone well. It turns out uh, the surgeon said, this tumor in your abdomen was the size of a baseball. Uh, it was impinging on your femoral nerve, but lo and behold, it was benign. And I said, what are the chances that that was gonna happen. He said, well, we see about 100 of these a year and four are benign. So you drew the long straw this time, which was great. I mean, that was, that was the news that I wanted to hear. Other people have not been so fortunate. But, uh, you know, because of my training and my curiosity about things, this, you know, in addition to giving birth to this tumor, it also gave birth to a book. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna talk to you about today. So uh, this is the book that came out of this. It's called What's Gotten Into Us? Uh, staying healthy in a toxic world. And the story uh, begins with a ship hitting an iceberg in 1912. Uh, now, the Titanic was famous for a lot of reasons, but it was strange because when uh, marine archaeologists brought it up and started looking at all the things that they found there, they found there was no plastic. On the most luxurious ocean liner in the world, 1912, there were no, there was no, uh, there were no products made out of petrochemicals. Let's say, so that's in 1912. Um, sorry, there's, you know, it, this is such a horrible topic. I have to, every now and then, just, you know, show Leo's face. Uh, so, you know, 30 years later, 30 years later, it's World War II, and now we're going through a massive industrial, uh, what do you call that? An industrial evolution, I guess, an explosion of production, and much of it uh, comes to rely on, on oil and things that we can make out of oil. So as the 20th century moves forward, we start to become, as we are now all too familiar, uh, dependent on petrochemicals. So, uh, you know, petrochemicals and, uh, are well known to, you know, newspaper readers for the times that they spill, uh, but it turns out that not all oil spills into the ocean. Uh, some of it is used to make our cars go, we know that, and it's, a lot of it is also used to make other things. So some of you in the room I know know a lot about this story, but I don't know if, if the rest of you have ever thought about the volume of these materials that are produced. So this says every day the United States makes or imports 27 trillion pounds, that's a T, uh, of chemicals enough to fill 623,000 tanker trucks each carrying 8,000 gallons from San Francisco to Washington and back. That's every day. U.S. Chemical Company. I, it's a funny thing to talk about this in Delaware, I, I recognize. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've got my Kevlar trademark vest on. Uh, U.S. Chemical Companies constitute a $637 billion industry. They produce raw materials for something like 70,000 products. Now, think about this. Think about 
the way you walk through your day and what you come into contact with. A great number of these products, as, as uh, I discovered, are virtually unregulated, meaning that we, the things that we surround ourselves with every day have come, to our, uh, come into our lives without any real uh, uh, scrutiny. Now, if I could just take one second and talk about the way this book is broken down. Uh, I tell my surgical scare story in the prologue uh, leading to the various questions that I come to investigate. Uh, the, the first chapter is called The Body, uh, and that l gives me an opportunity to talk about what are now known as body burden studies. Some of you may have, have heard about these. Um, the logical thing to do as a journalist, having been through this, this procedure, would have been uh, to get myself tested for the presence of synthetic, not to say carcinogenic or hormone disrupting or neurological uh, uh, problem inducing chemicals in my body, which one can do. Uh, my wife and I, you know, writers have to live in the real world, including marriages, and my wife told me, uh, we're not going through that. We're not, I don't need, having, you, having seen my husband go through this, we're not going to now go out and find that you have 50 carcinogenic chemicals resident in your tissue. I'm not doing that. So if you want to write about that, you've got to go find somebody else to do that. Uh, and luckily, there are plenty of people out there who have volunteered for this in different states. They've set up what are called body burden studies. So I decided to go to Maine. I was just in Maine yesterday talking to these folks. Uh, in Maine, some environmental and health groups figured out, as other states have, that uh, you know, um, legislators and voters don't seem to understand or don't seem to act on abstractions like, do you realize that there's synthetic chemicals in the environment? They don't, they don't get, they sort of know that, they, like they know there's carbon dioxide in the air, but they don't really know what to do with that, so they don't really do anything about it. What they've figured out is that people really respond when you find out, when they find out that there are these chemicals in your body, and some of these chemicals are transmittable by uh, breast milk, some of them are transmittable by, uh, through the placenta. When you, when you tell, especially young women, women, of, as they say, women of childbearing age, that they can not only have these chemicals in their body, but then can transmit them to their children, they tend to act, they tend to become politically engaged. And they figured this out in Maine, and it did, did a big study of this. So I went up there and, and talked to all these people, interviewed all these people that had been through this study, and on average, something like 45 chemicals per body, and that was only because they, te they only tested for like, I forget, a, a hundred or something. And as you know, and you'll see in a minute, there are 80,000 chemicals in circulation right now. They tested for a hundred, found 40, 45 or something like that. So that chapter is called The Body. The next chapter is called uh, The Home, where I invite a toxicologist to come into my house and walk room by room and do an, an essentially like a, a home inspection, but not to see if the roof is solid, but to see like what I, I now can do just looking around at the looking around the room, you know, uh, just seeing what things are, what they've been made of, and given his training, uh, what some of the troubles might might be. Um, the next chapter is called the Big Box Store, uh, where my wife and I took a natural history tour through a giant retailer, uh, and I won't tell you which one, uh, but it begins with a W. Uh, we walked aisle by aisle and looked at everything on the shelves and looked at what had labels on it and what didn't and found, among other things, that if you go into the automotive section, you can find uh, products, you know, aerosolized sprays or something, it'll say on the label, uh, warning, this product is known to be, knows, is known to cause cancer in, uh, in California. And I said, well, thank God, I'm in Maryland, you know. <laughs> uh, so that's in the automotive section. And then you go over to the cosmetic section, and you pick up a product that has no label on it. But once you know a little bit about it, you know it has the same carcinogenic ingredients in it, but there's no label. And the question is, why should you regulate something that you spray on your engine block and not regulate something that you put on your face? Which brings up, for the policy people in the room, all kinds of very interesting uh, real politic questions about uh, how industry and government interact, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. And then I will just tell you, because we're all here collaborating today, that I had the great pleasure of working with two Delaware um, faculty members, one uh, for the next chapter, which is called The Tap, which is trying to understand the contaminants that get into drinking water and how they get there. And I had the great pleasure of working with my dear friend, uh, Jerry Kaufman, who uh, was gracious enough to join me in a canoe trip down the Brandywine and then took me on a Dantean tour of a uh, uh, water treatment plant in Wilmington to follow 
uh, water almost from the moment it hits the ground to the moment it gets into your tap. And we went through and talked about agric agricultural contamination and things like that all the way into the ways that we can or cannot pull this stuff out. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And then the last chapter is called The Lawn, which I have to tell you uh, was my favorite chapter to work on. I've become slightly evangelical about lawns and lawn chemicals, and I got to work uh, only, I actually, in a way, I wrote this chapter in order to have an excuse to work with Doug Tallamy. Uh, many of you know him and his work on native plants and the usefulness of trying to think about lawn care in a different way that might support uh, native plants, native species like birds and butterflies and things. Uh, so that's, that's, so I've been, without even kind of knowing what to call it, I've actually been collaborating for a long time, who knew? But anyway, the, here we are. Uh, here we are back in mid-century now. You're going to recognize some of these images come out of Hagley. This is a, uh, you know, a 1950s era image. We're wrapping our, this is post-World War II now, we're wrapping our, our food in plastic. God knows that has uh, become standard now. Our bodies, if you could look at footage of what women were doing to each other to get the first nylons that came off the uh, conveyor belt, uh, as I tell my college students, it was kind of like a Justin Bieber concert. It was just scratching and clawing to get these things to wrap your legs in this. You just got to ask yourself, like, why? Uh, our homes, we've covered the earth with paint. You recognize this image. Like, this is used as a selling point. It's like, why call a, co a company Chem Lawn? You know, like, who does that appeal to? Well, uh, you know, for a while, it was a very, you know, very popular company. Our faces, of course, are covered in all kinds of things. Cosmetics industry is a $60 billion industry, virtually unregulated. And I will tell you, some of you know this, the cosmetics industry has generated probably the greatest heat in terms of, along with organic food, the food system, but the cosmetics activists have been very effective because this is where women have, have suddenly said, uh, you're telling me that you put what in my makeup? You know, and they, they start, to, uh, start to do things. Uh, so there are 400 chemicals used in American cosmetics that are prohibited in other countries, primarily in Europe. And yes, in fact, there are companies in Europe that make one version of their product for the European market and a different, more toxic version uh, for the United States. Our lawns, uh, you know, here we are, Norman Rockwell style, Levittown, post-war, uh, postage stamp kind of thing, where everyone's got their house and their lawn, and you start to develop this is where, I, where my fascination gets in, and I, I will just tip my hat to Adam Rome, our new hire in, in, in environmental history, who has written a fantastic book about the environmental history of the suburbs uh, called The Bulldozer in the Countryside, which you should run out and buy. Uh, he tells the story in great detail, but the peer pressure, the cultural peer pressure that developed out of this story where everyone had to have a lawn that looked like everyone else's lawn uh, had all kinds of repercussions. So the question you want to ask is, what does a lawn want to be when it grows up? A lawn wants to be a forest. You know, you guys know that. I usually ask that question to other audiences, and they think, uh, a flower garden? Um, but so the question is, what do you do to keep a lawn looking like that, looking like grass? Well, you have to spray it. Uh, and, you know, we, we've seen the story unfold. Now, ask anybody who is, I don't know what, 50 years old or older, if they have any memories of walking down their suburban streets and getting fogged by the DDT truck, and they will tell you all kinds of stories. I've heard this in, in virtually every state uh, where I've spoken about this. I love these effects. Ralph Begletter taught me how to do that. Uh, so this is what Doug Tallamy is writing about, right? This is what lawns look like now. This is the fantasy. This is the aesthetic model. We want five acres of unbroken monoculture grass. And just for those of you who don't know this, this is my chance. I'm an English major. Every now and then I get to, I love to talk about the little bit of science that I know. Did you know that clover, for example, used to be a highly desirable lawn plant? And it had the added benefit of taking nitrogen out of the air and sticking it in the soil, so now your, your soil is healthy. Well, the chemical companies figured out that they could, if they could convince you that clover was the devil, they could sell you a product that would kill all the clover and leave all the grass. And people bought it like crazy, and then found out that they had no nitrogen in the soil. So the chemical company said, well, we'll sell you synthetic nitrogen, too. Right? Perfect. So instead of selling you zero, zero products, we'll sell you two. And uh, we know the legacy of that. So bird populations in trouble all up and down the East Coast. We know this story. Uh, this is what it looks like every spring all over suburbia. Individual soldiers or armies of these chemical companies.
companies coming and spraying everything in sight. Um, I will say, I, I, I've been nervous about mentioning this, but I, I do mention in the story uh, of the lawns the moment when I was sitting out on the mall teaching a class on Rachel Carson, I think it was, one day about four years ago, and uh, as if on cue, as if I had conjured him, uh, a, a guy in a full body chem suit drove by on his tractor with six nozzles spraying in every direction right where we were sitting on the grass in front of Gore. And I said, you know, when you're a teacher, you're like, thank you. So I said to my students, who's going to go ask him what he's spraying? And a girl went up and said, excuse me, what are you spraying? And he said, oh, it's 2,4-D, don't worry about it. Uh, and where you're sitting, we sprayed that like four hours ago. And I said, all right, who knows what 2,4-D is? And I got to tell you, as an English professor, it's really cool to know what 2,4-D is. I said, you know, that, so 2,4-D, nobody had ever heard of it. I said, well, you ever heard of Agent Orange? And he said, oh, I think so. I said, that was in this war, you know, they used it to defoliate jungles in Vietnam. And 2,4-D is, uh, is like a 50% constituent of Agent Orange. And they're spraying it where you guys play barefoot frisbee. Just thought I'd drop that in there. So, uh, <clears throat> so it, it does bring up reasonable questions. I mean, I, I don't want to get all... Uh, preachy about this, but when a campus wants to think of itself as a green campus, it might also include, for example, the chemicals it sprays on its campus. It's not just about recycling, it's also about that, and I think that's worth talking about. So since the Titanic went down with no petrochemicals on board, now we've got them everywhere, right? Some people would look at this image and say, isn't that great? We're, we're recycling. That's a wonderful thing. Of course, we know the percentages of things that get recycled is small. So you have things like the Pacific Garbage Patch, or known as the Pacific Gyre, where you, you know, you've got a guy who can take a seining net and pull up more plastic than plankton, you know, and it works itself up the food chain and all that. Now, uh, scientists can find toxic man-made chemicals on the top of Aconcagua, the highest peak in South America. They can find them in the blood of the Inuit in the Arctic. They can find them in the breast tissue of beluga whales, which are starting to develop breast cancer. I'm sure you've, you've heard some of this. Um, some, some of you may have studied this. Uh, but it's not just these images now. It's not just oil spills that cause us to understand uh, about contamination. We're also finding out that we have these chemicals in our bodies. That's really manipulative, but it, it works. It's a very effective thing when I'm talking to uh, undergraduates. So um, now what you have are groups around the country, from the CDC on down to different states, trying to understand uh, the connection between chemicals in our bodies uh, and health. So in Europe, as you probably know, if you find uh, chemicals that are prevalent in the environment and, for example, carcinogenic in a laboratory, that's all they need to know, they ban the chemical. And the, that's, in other words, that's a way of thinking about chemicals as uh, guilty until proven innocent, and in this country it's the reverse. You have to find some person, Aaron Brockovich style, who can prove that a group got cancer because of a particular product and hire a good lawyer who can run it all up the flagpole and get that thing taken off the market. That's a, a much different uh, paradigm. So 80,000 chemicals in use today, roughly how many have been adequately tested for their health effects? About 200, which it looks like that. Many chemicals labeled, as I mentioned, as carcinogens in the hardware aisle uh, are unlabeled in the cosmetics aisle. One in 10 American families uses a commercial lawn care service. One in five applies pesticides itself. I've talked to uh, these advocates for uh, non-toxic lawn care, and they think you should need a license to use pesticides that people running to the hardware store. You follow your nose, the next time you're in a hardware store, just go follow your nose into the uh, herbicide section and see if it does, your body doesn't intuitively not want to be there. Uh, he, he would say that it's, it's crazy that people are allowed to just reach their hands into uh, bags of this stuff and spray it all over the place. 10% uh, of pesticides in common use have been adequately tested. Just one study to mention, studies show in Denver, uh, a Denver study said the kids whose yards were treated with pesticides are four times more likely to develop soft tissue tumors than kids uh, whose yards were not. Now, this is the kind of tumor that I had. Now, it turns out mine was benign, but I did grow up in a family in suburban New York with ortho products, like, dripping out of the garage and the shed. Uh, who knows? Uh, total acreage of lawns in the United States, somewhere between 43 and 50 million acres. Uh, it's about that big. Now, if you think about what it would take to spray Nebraska, uh, you're talking about a lot of chemicals. 
Now, you know, we all live in this, this great mid-Atlantic region with all these great watersheds at Delaware Bay, the, the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, runoff from suburban fertilizers and pesticides cause widespread damage to rivers and bays. We know about this. Uh, this is what the Chesapeake Bay, as you all know, looks like in August, these uh, hypoxic dead zones. This is not just, obviously, suburban runoff. It's, it's also very importantly from chicken manure, but uh, major, major problem. Uh, pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, this is something Jerry and I talked about. Uh, you may have heard about this in the news. Uh, about five years ago, the Associated Press went around to every municipal water treatment plant in the United States and tested the tap water coming out of them, and they found uh, pharmaceutical drugs in virtually every sample they tested, including uh, Viagra in the water coming out of the tap in LA, um, which makes a sort of sense. Uh, there was also antipsychotic drugs in the tap water in Philadelphia. And, you know, maybe they should up the dosage for the football fans up there. I don't know. But they're, they're in, in other words, quantifiable amounts, small amounts, but quantifiable amounts in all municipal water supply. And the question is, how do you get that out? Municipal water plants were designed 150 years ago to take out or kill things like cholera, dysentery. Uh, what do you do with Viagra? What do you do with, uh, you know, the phthalates? that make plastic water bottles that get into water that they're also sh finding in drinking water. So I've done this so many, I mean, I, this, this, I just love this prop. I mean, this, these are so ubiquitous, you just can't get away from them. Chinese drugs, uh, we know, along with many other products made in China, uh, you've heard stories about them being made with diethylene glycol, uh, which is used to make antifreeze. Uh, a couple of years ago, you probably read uh, tens of millions of kids' toys were being recalled because they were painted with lead paint. And you thought that we'd gotten away from that back in the 70s, right? Get rid of lead paint, but here it is showing up on toys. Uh, bisphenol A has been in the news a lot. This is the plastic used to make hard, hard plastic drinking water bottles uh, or drinking bottles. You know this, right? So the phthalates that make soft water bottles, you can quantify. In fact, the EPA is now allow, officially allowing phthalates in water. Uh, bisphenol A is used to make hard plastic. And the trouble with hard plastic, especially with baby bottles, is you put it on the stove, heat it up, and the plastic starts to leak into the, into the breast milk uh, even faster. Flame retardants. This is a great story of uh, regulation in Sweden. Uh, they found out these flame retardants, which are neurotoxic, among other things, were showing up in women's breast tissue. So they banned them. And in three years, the amount of these chemicals showing up in women's breast tissue dropped by 30% in three years. Uh, not so here in the United States, where you find these flame retardants in all kinds of things, from kids' pajamas. You, it's actually virtually, I think it is actually literally impossible to buy pajamas that are not treated with flame retardants in this country. Uh, all kinds of um, electronics also have them. Phthalates, uh, I was just, as I mentioned, I was in Maine yesterday. Maine, the reason I was there is they passed recently the most comprehensive anti-toxics law in the United States a couple years ago. And these activists brought a 30-foot tall inflatable rubber duck right into the state house and said, this is what we're talking about. Uh, so you know, these, these industries have said, look, we know there are phthalates in these, but we did not intend these products to be put in kids' mouths. But you also find phthalates in things like uh, body lotions, detergents, air fresheners, uh, which don't deserve the name. Uh, so what should we do? Uh, what are we going to do about all this? This is a big debate in the, in the activist community. Should we have uh, market-based, in other words, uh, you know, inform the consumers, make them demand better products, and that'll change things from a market perspective, or legislative? Uh, I won't read these, but uh, it, on the legislative front, the EU has done some very progressive work on this stuff, uh, requiring the companies do much more legwork before they release products or chemicals out onto the market. Canada, likewise, way ahead of us in banning things like bisphenol A. Uh, in the United States, uh, as, as you might imagine, it's almost all self-regulated voluntary work on the part of industry. Government has had very little effect. Um, let's see here. Uh, Frank Lautenberg from New Jersey is the point man on this. He's been introducing uh, a bill to try to update the uh, what's called TOSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act, which was passed 35 years ago, has not been changed since then, uh, trying to get a little bit more uh, current science behind these products. 
Uh, but with the feds nowhere in sight, states like they are often in climate change are actually getting pretty active on this. Uh, Maine, California, Maryland, uh, Illinois, Oregon, Washington, there are states doing some very interesting things all over the place, um, which I'll, I can tell you about. Uh, the consumer angle, you know, if you, if you don't feel, this is now when I'm talking to, to, to general audiences, not to you all, I realize, but uh, you know, the, the general public just, they don't want to know about all the context, they just want to know what do I buy, like what do I buy, how do I, how do I act in the marketplace? And the general rule of thumb is, uh, I've kind of stolen this idea from Michael Pollan when he's talking about food, but uh, you want to go old school. You want to, uh, you know, eat things that you recognize. So for example, it's funny I say this today after Twinkie just went bankrupt yesterday, but apples are better than Twinkies, right? So maybe people are getting smart. Maybe people have decided, you know, apples are still around, Twinkies go bankrupt. You know, it took them a while, but there they are. That doesn't mean you can't still eat them, right? They're maybe 40 years old, but you can still eat them because they, they never decompose. Uh, apples are better than Twinkies, just as you should eat real food with ingredients you can recognize, so you should consider only buying things made from materials you can pronounce. I realize this is a dangerous thing to say in Delaware, uh, because God knows what would happen to our economy or our university if we ever actually did that. But cotton sleepwear, avoid flame retardants in your pajamas, especially for your kids. Uh, laundry detergents, you can buy them made out of plants instead of out of synthetics. Mattresses made out of wool, you can buy mattresses that have no flame retardants if you buy them at Ikea because it's a Swedish company, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, there's this new invention called olive oil, uh, which actually works just as well as Teflon and uh, it's, you know, the good fat. Uh, you know, you want wood and, and cabinetry made out of real wood instead of uh, plywood, unless you can find plywood that's made with out formaldehyde, which is now increasingly possible, but wasn't for a long time. Uh, clean your kitchen, your bathroom, your laundry, your teeth, your hair, anything else that needs to be cleaned with products made out of plants uh, rather than chlorine and other toxic synthetics. Seventh generation, I interviewed the guy who uh, designs products for seventh generation in beautiful Burlington, Vermont, and uh, you know th this is his whole life. He uh, designs these things. Uh, tap water, Jerry Coffin is, is quite adamant about this, you know, no matter what, the, what Dasani tells you, drinking water out of the tap is probably still your best bet, at least it's regulated. At least you're not getting uh, phthalates from the bottle in the tap water. Uh, carpeting, you know, you want to try to find wool carpeting if you can instead of, uh, or, or I should say wool rugs instead of wall-to-wall -wall, uh, synthetics. Uh, get rid of all, anything you can spray out of a can is probably best stuck in a, uh, in a, in a garbage bag. Uh, when the, when the uh, toxicologist came to my house, he said, the best thing I have to convince people about the toxics in their house is I say, uh, go around your house and ke collect every single thing that is in, in a spray can or in a paint can, anything that's, that it, you can smell, essentially, and put it in a big garbage bag and tie a knot around it. And like a month later, open it up and stick your face in there. You know, and when I was walking through the, the big box store, I, I tried to imagine what it would be like if you could put a plastic bag around the entire store and do the same thing. Try it the next time you're in a big box store. Just follow your nose. Like, check out the lavender, the so-called lavender smell. Uh, you won't forget it. Uh, buy toys made out of wood if you can instead of plastic. There are all kinds of, we I have all kinds of websites in the back of the book uh, to talk about places you can turn to, to buy stuff that's different. Air fresheners, right? Uh, this is a, actually a, a line my wife came up with. She said, um, you know, if you want your house, your house to smell like an apple pie, imagine this, imagine actually baking an apple pie uh, instead of spraying an apple pie. If you use cosmetics, uh, this is, goes without saying, avoid products with no ingredient labels. This is something that Seventh Generation has figured out as a marketing tool. If you buy a, a bottle of uh, laundry detergent from Seventh Generation, it's got like a, uh, an accordion label on it that just comes out and out and out and you're like suddenly reading like War and Peace about what, what went into making laundry detergent. As opposed, they're banking on the fact that their market wants information. Most products have zero information and as a consumer what you want to do is penalize companies that provide you nothing and reward companies that provide you everything because as we know from organic food, like labels actually mean something. Labels force industries to, uh, you know, comply or get, get smart. Uh, let's see, safecosmetics.org for those of you interested in that. Uh, basement in the garage, the, the dirtiest uh, uh, chemicals, chemically speaking place in my house is my basement 
where this toxicologist, he said, your house looks pretty good, but let's go down. And he opened the door, and he's like, whoa. And he got this face full. He said, what, what is going on down there? I said, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And he said, well, come on down. Let's go take a look. And there was seven years' worth of half-empty cans of paint, caulk, adhesives, uh, uh, you know, paint removers, grout, uh, you know, all these things. And he's like, what are you doing? What is this stuff doing here? And I said, I don't know. It's just... That's what you do, isn't it? I said, you, he said, do you realize your kitchen is right upstairs? The stuff is all just vaporizing straight into your kitchen. So what do you do with that stuff? Craigslist, right? I put it on free paint on Craigslist, and I got 100 responses in about eight minutes, and boom, it was gone. And all those neurotoxins were somebody else's problem. <laughs> the lawn. Uh, if you use a lawn care service and they insist, or a campus, <clears throat> and that insists on using pesticides, uh, find a different company. Uh, this will be good for your health and the environment. Better yet, consider tearing up parts of your lawn, replacing it with native plants, trees, shrubs, flowers, butterflies, and birds. Well, thank you. I, I have this extremely self-righteous uh, uh, side of my personality, as I'm sure you can tell. And I have a one-eighth of an acre uh, in Baltimore. And I have, that's what it kind of looks like. I mean, that's not my house, but those are the flowers I have. And I'm the only house in the neighborhood that has, in the spring and summer, like crazy butterflies and, uh, uh, you know, goldfinches and hummingbirds and all the kids in the neighborhood come to my house to look at my birds and they don't have them. And I just think, like, wouldn't that be a great idea, like an aesthetic alternative to the five acres of, of you know, sanitized grass? So, and I blame my self-righteousness on Doug Talmy, by the way. Uh, so this is what it could look like. And this is Talmy's book, if you don't know it, Bringing Nature Home is a terrific, extremely accessible book about, um, envisioning your lawn in a different kind of way. Uh, so that's what I had to say. I, I uh, for all kinds of reasons, have had to set up a website that's got all kinds of uh, resources and kind of breaking news on this. There's stuff breaking about this all over the place all the time, and I keep that updated. Uh, so if anybody's interested in more information or contacting me, that's where you can find me. So thank you for listening. That's what I had to say. Good question. Uh, the, the thing about when you mentioned plastics and, and hospitals, right? You said something about that. Uh, if, you, if you talk to people who uh, are interested in the environmental uh, toxicity of hospitals, they will tell you, this is no secret, that it's an incredibly toxic place. In, not just because of bacteria, but because of many of the products they use, including things like the PVC that they use in the tubes or the, ba the bags. I mean, there's actually... Uh, it's a strong enough movement that some major healthcare companies have started to redesign the way that they buy um, products for their hospitals because they're realizing that you stick cancer patients on a tube that's dumping PVC into their veins. It's probably not going to be beneficial. So I, that's just one, one thing to say. Um, as far as, I mean, I think skepticism about this is absolutely well, well that's a, a well taken point of view. I mean, I think the science is still relatively new. But another way to think about it is the science is relatively new. In other words, these chemicals have been around not for forever. They've been around for a few decades. And the science is just starting to finally catch up with it. 
So if you think about some of these chemicals only being around for 40 or 50 years, uh, the, a reasonable question would be who, who really knows what's going on? All I can tell you is that the science, as I understand it, can say things like we know in a laboratory that these things cause cancer, for example, or they cause hormone disruptions or whatever they cause. And as they say in Europe, we also know they're showing up in everybody's bodies. You can absolutely demonstrate that. So those two things come together in Europe, that's enough. In this country, it's like prove it to me. Prove it to me that because they're in your body, they're a problem. And until you can prove it to me in a legal sense, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that that one day that you took a drink out of that bottle caused you to grow you know, a third ear or something like that, you can't win a case. And of course, that's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. What they are going to be able to do, in my, my estimation, is they're going to be able to say uh, that your preponderance of whatever you want to say, mercury, arsenic, flame retardant, stain resistors, phthalates, whatever it is, uh, may well have contributed to your tumor or your uh, neurological problems or your, you know, your reproductive problems or whatever it is. I think the science is, is accumulating very rapidly in that direction. So I think it's fair enough to be skeptical, but uh, this is a, a question I wouldn't necessarily push in this audience, but when, I, when, I'm, asking, when I'm asked a question like that from a non-expert, a reasonable question to ask is, what do you think has made you so skeptical? Like, what is it that makes you say, there's no way in hell that Teflon can be bad for me? Like, how, because every question, every culturally accepted question comes from somewhere, right? So the fact that you are, as they say, drinking the Kool-Aid, it's, you know, either the Kool-Aid coming from there or coming from there, but if you were absolutely resistant, absolutely insistent that it could not possibly be a problem, you might ask yourself, or someone, conceivably could ask yourself, well, why do I, how, where did I come to that feeling that everything is absolutely safe? Somebody is watching over the products I use. Because I can demonstrate that nobody is in fact watching. All right? So the question is, where is your self-confidence that everything is benign? I don't say that in a, in a crowd full of, of experts, but in a crowd full of, uh, you, know, um, you know, general readers, uh, it's, not all of them ever think to ask how they think or why they think the way they do. Oh, uh, maybe one more question. Go ahead. Thanks for an interesting talk. And this question kind of was on the previous one of your answer, but I guess if I was an attorney, I might say that since the Titanic times and the last life expectancy for both sexes has gone up almost a decade or more, which might some folks might say, well, there is something that's not harmonized collectively, individually, with the certain chemical protections we have. So I wonder how you would answer. I think that's a really good question, and I think one could write a whole book on that. Like, so given all the chemicals, why is it that we're living longer? Well, I, there are, everyone in this room could provide a very sophisticated answer to that in a, from a different perspective. I'll offer a couple things. First of all, I don't think it's because, I mean, maybe it's because we have so many chemicals in our bodies that we're just more well-preserved. <laughs> who knows? Uh, but you know, there will people, be people who say that it's because we're eating tons more protein than we need, our bodies are bigger and healthier and stronger. Uh, there are other, other people more cynical that would say, that's fine, but we're all getting cancer. Uh, we're just learning to live with cancer longer or something. And is that a bargain that you want? Sure, you can nice, live a nice long life, but 40 years of it are going to be as a cancer survivor. So, I mean, I think there are plenty of ways to answer that, but I don't think that we should necessarily say that chemistry has only been a positive. I think it's worth, even in this state, it's, it's worth thinking about the entire picture, not just the, uh, you know, living better through chemistry. So, thank you very much. Thank you, McKay, for a very provocative talk. Now we're going to lead into the last portion of the morning session before we have lunch, and you have an opportunity to view posters. Um, and this is a panel discussion that we're assembling to talk about how we can better integrate the sciences, uh, engineering, social sciences, environmental humanities. At the, the Delaware Environmental Institute, uh, a major emphasis has been and will continue to be environmental science and engineering. But we also recognize that, that all the scientific data and the evidence that we collect and analyze and all the technological solutions we devise don't really amount to very much unless we're able to get the word out about them to individual citizens and to our society's decision makers. We must be able to influence both policy and human behavior if we're to turn our discoveries into environmental solutions for the planet. 
And so we find ourselves increasingly turning to colleagues with expertise in economics, in ethics, communication, history, education, policy, psychology, and sociology for help with this aspect of our work. And so we're delighted that a new program in environmental humanities is getting underway here at the University of Delaware. Add to this the practical consideration that agencies such as the National Science Foundation are increasingly emphasizing science communication, ethics, policy, and education in our sponsored research. And so we felt that the time was right to establish closer ties between these segments of the university. So at this point in the program, we're very pleased to present a panel discussion that will explore the question of how scientists and engineers can work together with humanist and social scientists to increase the effectiveness at all that we do. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Tom Powers, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy and is the Director of the Center for Science, Ethics, and Public Policy, uh, which has been associated with Denon since its inception in 2009. And so I'll leave it to Tom to introduce the, the panel members. Good morning. So if I can have all of the members of the panel um, come to the, to the stage here. McKay Jenkins, who you've just heard from, is in the Department of English here. Um, Adam Rome, our new colleague from Penn State University. Adam is uh, so new to the state of Delaware, he's still trying to pay uh, sales tax, I think. Um, Victor Perez from Sociology. Holly Michael from Geological Sciences. And Andrea Sarzinski uh, from Public Policy, who you heard from earlier uh, this morning. So the, the format for the panel uh, will be as follows. Uh, we have here represented uh, on the stage a great deal of wisdom about how to operate in the gap that C.P. Snow called uh, the two cultures. And these people um, come from a variety of disciplines but have all traversed this gap and populated it, um, maybe gone through and come back out the other side. So what we're going to do with respect to this question uh, getting to know one another uh, with respect to the people in the environmental humanities and social sciences and the physical and life sciences. <coughs> Try to get, get some wisdom from these people. We're going to um, allow them to introduce themselves for about five minutes, and I'll, I'll try to um, I'll ask them to keep it short. And then um, I'd like to ask you to, to squeeze that extra bit of wisdom out of them. Um, we'll, we'll try to have a highly interactive session um, leading up to lunch. So um, before I uh, begin and let them uh, start on their five-minute introductions, I want to um, thank Beth Chages for setting up this panel and for conceiving in large part of the kinds of questions that these people will answer. Um, Victor, would you like to start it off for us? Hi, how you doing? I, uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank Don Sparks and everyone involved in Denon for the invitation. Uh, as well as Tom Apple and George Watson and everyone here. So I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Uh, I know I, I have, and McKay's talk in particular was great. So thanks again for having me. Uh, my name is Victor Perez. I'm in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice here. <coughs> Excuse me. And more or less, I'm a medical sociologist. But as a sociologist, I come to this uh, probably with a different orientation than someone in engineering or in biochemical or, or what, um, whatever it might be. But one thing I think is consistent is that in saving the planet, we're saving ourselves. And so the theme of the, of the talk, uh, I kind of can, th can think about that theme as a sociologist in a different way. Because if we're saving ourselves and if there's lots of uh, research on what we're doing to the planet and how to make the planet healthier and how to regain the health of the planet and so on and so forth, uh, we need to think about what it's doing to us and how that will improve our health as human beings. So largely, my, my study as a sociologist is the relationship between the environment and human health. And so my approach has been one of uh, lay social movements in particular. There is an interesting and I think very tricky relationship between the uh, institution of science and the method of science and how lay people understand that and how lay people interact with that, but also in particular how lay people form their own rational conclusions about their health outcomes. And so what I've been more or less uh, getting involved in is this issue in Delaware is uh, the cancer cluster issue. 
Uh, this actually came from, derived from my work in autism. I studied for uh, quite some time autism as a social movement, and in particular how lay people, parents of children with autism, uh, developed their own ideas that were not validated by science, that fell outside of the scientific parameters about the causes of their children's autism. And this came from a, a, a body of work known as popular epidemiology out of uh, Phil Brown at uh, Brown University. And <clears throat> really what it involves in, uh, what it involves is how lay people uh, more or less mobilize themselves politically and scientifically in their own communities in trying to address what they find to be unusual health outcomes in their own communities. And oftentimes, science cannot uh, provide them a direct connection between a particular exposure and their human health outcomes. And so it's really about a, a collective political identity and a collective political movement where they're becoming empowered both through uh, social movements and social organization, but also as more or less kind of novice scientists. And so as a sociologist, what I'm keenly interested in right now with the cancer cluster issue is, I think, uh, something that's very important across the board for all of us interested in the environment, and that is knowledge. And in a sense, how knowledge becomes validated, both scientific and other forms of knowledge acquisition. So, uh, you know, the social construction of knowledge is a key tenet in sociology. And if I could, if I could you know, share with you a quote from Phil Brown and some of his colleagues, uh, concerning this issue, he, he wrote that uh, contested in medical disputes, say for example about uh, a cancer outcome, uh, is what will count as valid knowledge of the relationships between environments and diseases validity. It depends more often on social movements, lawsuits and the court of public opinion than on clinical and epidemiological research. And so while the historical voice of science as the final arbiter of important mysteries is by no means over, it plainly doesn't uh, it plainly doesn't solve the issue or give the uh, last uncontested word of matters of human health and environments. And so, you know, the scientific knowledge providing a direct connection between uh, an exposure and a health outcome is full of uncertainty, and I'm interested in that. I'm interested in how that knowledge uh, is generated and what it means to lay people, what it means to science, and trying to bridge the gap between the two. And so our panel here and everyone here today, one of the things that we could do in trying to foster interdisciplinarity is to, is to think about how a sociologist can inform uh, someone who does you know, plant and soil sciences about social movements and how within communities, how information about, say, contaminated groundwaters might be uh, understood and interpreted and utilized, and also the limitations of that. And so as a sociologist, I'm, I'm, I'm keenly interested, again, in these sorts of, uh, of social movements. And here's a simple scenario of, of you know, a, a, a good outcome or, or product of interdisciplinarity. Uh, the EPA, for example, might not measure certain contaminants in soil or groundwater unless they go beyond a certain level. But let's say in a community that there are, you know, kind of lower level exposure to these contaminants over time. That's something the EPA wouldn't be tracking. But the people within that community may well be, and they may well find important, unusual patterns in, say, human health outcomes. And so what I'm trying to do is trying to uh, investigate and kind of foster a discussion across the different sciences that takes into account the important human lived experiences of the people who are having these health outcomes. And <clears throat> it's a tricky business, and I mean, as McKay kind of uh, touched on this, it's very difficult to say that, yes, this gave you this. And uh, that is where, that is a sociologist's you know, territory where it becomes political and where social movements are involved in validating people's experiences. And so hopefully uh, you know, we can work on some of these things and create some, some cross-pollination uh, and to think about how the human lived experience can, can connect with the laboratory experience in a deeper way. So thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, like everyone else, I'm especially grateful to everyone who made it possible for me to, to be sitting here. And this really is actually my first full week uh, on the faculty. And what better way to start uh, to be able to be in a panel like this with an audience like this uh, and meeting so many interesting, exciting people that I'm looking forward to getting to know better. Uh, I'm, by training, a historian. And my specialty is the history of how mostly Americans, although I also at the undergraduate level teach a course just called Nature and History that's about how people all over the world in all times since the rise of agriculture have related to, to the environment. 
but, but my research and most of my teaching is about how Americans have thought about uh, the environment, how we've used and abused uh, nature through time, uh, and especially the, the history of what we would now call the environmental movement, although uh, the environmental movement is, is much older than anyone in this room. Uh, it didn't have that name until around 1970, the time of the first Earth Day. Uh, but people have been trying in the United States to solve environmental problems. They've been aware of a ver variety of environmental problems going back 150 years. Uh, and one of the, the two big questions, I guess, that I, I, I'm increasingly focusing on are why do we have environmental problems in the first place? What, what are the deepest roots uh, of our environmental problems? Some of them are quite recent. Um, as McKay talked about, many of the environmental problems we have relate to uh, technologies, chemicals, products that didn't exist uh, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. But some of the other reasons we have environmental problems are much, much deeper than that. They go back uh, centuries, even, even more than centuries. And it's worth thinking about why. Uh, but even more interesting to me is since some Americans, and this is also true in, in Europe and in Asia, uh, and to a lesser extent uh, in, in Latin America, uh, I don't know hardly anything about Africa, I'm, I'm afraid to say, but um, uh, since people have been trying to, to address environmental problems for quite a long time, the other really, really interesting question to me is, why do we still have environmental problems? If, if we've cared about it and we've become more and more and more and more concerned about it, uh, how come, if anything, the problems that we face now seem even more challenging than ever before? And um, uh, one way that that, I, I think, potentially is a, of a value to people outside my discipline um, is uh, uh, a lot of the, the brightest ideas today about how to deal with environmental problems are not actually new. Uh, and I, I found this out was working on my first book, which was about how Americans first came to define sprawl as a problem and to, and to begin to uh, set an agenda for addressing the environmental impacts of sprawl. And, and first of all, it turned out it was much longer ago than I thought. I, I just took for granted when I started that, that it wouldn't have been before about 1970. Uh, the year of the first Earth Day, the year of the EPA, uh, the Clean Air Act. Uh, but in fact, I, my book ends around that time. Uh, I found that Americans had been thinking about some of these issues all through the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. Uh, but I also, every day, I'd open up my newspaper, and this would be even more true if I were living in Delaware than when I was living in State College, PA. Uh, and people talking about ideas for dealing with sprawl that, in fact, people had talked about 30 years before, 40 years before. So uh, because they didn't work before doesn't mean they can't work now, but I don't think you can try to solve the problems without knowing the history, without knowing what might have led to the failures before or the partial successes. Um, have circumstances changed that might make an old idea seem novel and fresh and workable? Or, or do the same obstacles still seem to apply? Um, and I've, I've also uh, been very interested in, in uh, uh, the story of how um, experts and grassroots activists interact or don't in solving problems. Um, I, I've just finished a book about Earth Day, the first Earth Day. Um, and, 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 and one of the reasons that the environmental movement became powerful again, more powerful than ever before in the 60s and 70s, was uh, that in an earlier time, um, experts and grassroots activists, who were also often men and women, uh, stopped working together. Uh, they had worked together a lot uh, uh, in the late 19th century, early 1900s, and then for a variety of reasons, increasingly grew apart. Uh, and they only began to collaborate again in a big way um, in, in the 60s and 70s, and that's part of the it's one, only one reason, but it's one important reason that hasn't gotten enough attention for why the environmental movement came to be stronger. Uh, so I, I think looking at, at um, where the pressure comes from, is it professionals, is it scientists, is it uh, local activists, uh, is it parents, is, is really uh, an interesting historical question that also can help uh, and empower people today who are, are trying to address environmental problems. I, I totally agree with Don uh, that one thing that uh, humanists can help 
with, and this is, I, I have a joint appointment, part of my appointment is in English, and I'm really interested in how writing about environment by non-experts, by journalists, um, how it's changed in the last 50 years. This year is the 50th anniversary of the publication of Silent Spring. Um, if Rachel Carson had been here to talk, I don't think you would have laughed once. Uh, you would have thought that what she said was profound, but um, McKay is a perfect example, even the title of his book, of how writing about environmental issues has changed, especially in the last decade. It's hipper, it's often very funny, uh, it, it draws on other, other genres beside polemic or nature writing or science, uh, memoir, adventure literature, uh, even science fiction. Uh, but I'm really, really interested in, in how uh, we try to get people to care about these issues. Uh, and, and that's something that I know many scientists are, uh, are, are interested in and often frustrated about. They, they feel like they have done great work and people don't appreciate it. Uh, I, I think the humanists can help with that. Uh, but the one last thing that, that I, I, I've begun to think more about is that uh, I don't think we can just help uh, communicate more effectively or uh, think about how the, the ways in which uh, we talk about environmental problems might carry baggage that we're not aware of. I also think that humanists can help um, clarify the agenda. Uh, before you even start your research, think about why it matters. Um, how will this help us have a better life? And that's really what this is all about. We, we talk about the environment usually as though it's some separate thing, it's a subset of problems. Uh, uh, but, it, but really, the deepest question, and this is fundamentally a humanities question, but it's an interdisciplinary question. You'd, you'd be stupid to try to answer this question without understanding how the physical world actually works, uh, is what role does nature play in the good life? And, that's something that even in one room, you're gonna get a lot of different answers to, but it's even more true if you take different times and different places. Uh, and time, just like geography, um, allows you to think outside the box. People think differently in the past, just as they may think differently in other parts of the world today. Uh, and, and if you're trying to, to think fresh thoughts about how to uh, uh, have a better human world, uh, in, th that recognizes our uh, fundamental inescapable dependence on the non-human world, uh, I, I think being able to understand how different people at different times and different places have thought about these issues can, can really stretch your imagination, give you new questions to ask, even new scientific questions, uh, as well as new policy questions. Thanks. Thanks. McKay? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> no, I, you've heard enough from me already, but I'll, I'll say a few things I want to thank. Adam, uh, I think that's the only time in my life I've been called hip. <laughs> so thank you for that. I'm, I'm never going to forget that. Uh, when he's talking about the, the progression of environmental writing, I, I was reminded that when Norman McLean tried to sell his story, A River Runs Through It, uh, to New York publishers, he, this is legendary in publishing circles, he was told that, that no one would publish it because it, the book had too many trees in it. Uh, and then finally, he, it fell upon University of Chicago Press to publish that book, and it became you know, a multi-generational bestseller. I, I will tell you, when, when this book came out, uh, my New York publisher kept saying, this book is about health. It is not about the environment. Remember that. And I said, that's because you live in New York, and there's no environment here. Like Everyone else lives in a place where those two things are not disconnected. Um, so uh, just real quick, I, I was a I, I, I say I used to be a journalist. I'm still a journalist. I just don't write short form anymore. I write mostly long form. Uh, and I teach journalism in a very strange time when journalism appears to be dying everywhere we look. Uh, and that makes a very interesting thing. So when a student comes up to me and says, I want to be a, a journalist, I, I don't really know what to say anymore. And I, for 15 years, I've been here uh, assigning my introductory students. Uh, they, they are required to read the I used to just call it the New York Times. They have to read the hard copy New York Times every day. And this may be the first time since I've been here that I don't require that, that I just say, you got to read it somehow. And now the question is, how do I ensure that they're reading it? Because they're not even bringing it to class anymore. So this is actually evolving right as we, uh, as we sit here. Um, that said, I, I have come to believe, and I, I, this is one of these rare moments where I've actually, I feel like my prognostications have, be, have come true. I think that journalism is, in a way, uh, an optimal way to teach undergraduates because uh, by its nature, journalism is an interdisciplinary 
phenomenon. Every single day, my students, even the most beginning students, have to go out and talk to every kind of person, not just from every discipline, but they have to talk to rich people and poor people and white people and black people and rural people and urban people and immigrants and you know the whole, the whole uh, you know carnival of humanity is what they have to interact with. So they don't get to specialize. It, it, that can be a problem later on, but they have to uh, you know really expose themselves to lots of things. Uh, I just want to mention something. So Adam and I are going to start talking as of I think about half an hour from now about this environmental humanities minor, but I decided that I would get a jump on it this fall and teach uh, an environment, a course that might be a model for uh, an introductory uh, environmental humanities class. And I called it, uh, I forget what, English 267 or something it was, uh, environmental, Introduction to Environmental Humanities, colon, the Chesapeake Bay. So I decided that why not uh, take a laboratory of sorts and focus on that thing from multiple points of view. So just to give you an idea of the way, and this is the first time I've taught it, the first time I've thought about it, but this is the way it turned out. I decided that I would uh, invite loads of guest speakers from all kinds of disciplines. I would also include some field work uh, in the class, or field uh, experiences. So I had, uh, among other people, Maggie Anderson came and talked about the sociology of slavery on the Eastern Shore. Uh, I had Jerry Kaufman come in and talk about water quality issues. I had Del Levia come in and talk about forest hydrology. I had Tom Horton, the great uh, journalist about the Chesapeake Bay for the last 30 years, used to be a staff writer at the Baltimore Sun, has written all kinds of books, come in and talk about covering uh, the Chesapeake Bay over 30 years. When he's asked the question, why is it that we haven't cleaned up the Chesapeake Bay? He says, he wrote a, a National Geographic cover story about the Bay uh, about 25 years ago, and then he wrote another National Geographic story uh, about it about two years ago. And the second one was basically answering this question, like why, why am I still writing about how the Bay is dying? And his answer was, people don't care enough. He says, after all the time I spent on it, they just don't care enough. And that's, we, we, there are all kinds of ways to interpret that, but that's, that's his perspective. Um, then I had, in this particular class, I took my students on a Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, trip. You know, any chance I have to get in a canoe, I, I, I run at. So we, we got a bunch of canoes and paddled the Susquehanna River and uh, did some water test. I mean, this is English department water testing, but <laughs> water testing, you know, talked about, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, we talk about all kinds of things. Among them, the fact that there are these hydro dams and nuclear power plants and all this going on right next to the, I mean, all these kids are like, wow, that was the best day I ever had in college. And I said, well, so you, because you were out on the water and they said, yeah, it was pouring rain the entire day and they still thought it was the greatest day they had in college. I said, boy, you guys, this is like the last child in the woods problem. I, said, I, don't, I don't think students get to be outside even in environmental classes. I, for years, have uh, required my environmental literature students to go, the, their only requirement besides the reading is to go typically into White Clay Creek, go, to the, go, to, go find a space in the, in the woods where water and land meet, and sit in that place every week for 14 weeks, for one hour, go there every single week to the same place and tell me what happens. Basically, that's the assignment. Now, they think it's a, a nature journaling thing, which it is, and I'm asking them to watch things unfold here, as you know, here, if you sit in a place for 14 weeks, you get three seasons. Either you get summer into winter or you get winter into summer. And they get to watch things unfold or die back and they get to write about it. But the, the, the secret mission, of course, is they're also, uh, they, they, they have to start looking out first, but then they slowly start to realize this is also about looking in and they start to realize that I've slipped them a little like meditation training on the side, you know, without calling it that. But they're looking at outside environments, they're looking at psychological environments, and they're trying to understand all this, and they have to write about it every week. And it, it's, a, it's a great way to basically force them to get out in, this, in the woods. Um, and in another class I taught that was similar to this, uh, I had students go on a toxic tour of East Baltimore, where we went down to the city and got, uh, which is where I live, and got uh, an, an activist there to take us into the neighborhood that is just a little bit east of, of Johns Hopkins, where I will tell you uh, the uh, uh, town and gown relations uh, are not exactly rosy. Uh, the people in East Baltimore live within sight two blocks of the greatest medical center in the universe, and they feel utterly neglected by it. Uh, they, there's health, uh, as Victor can, can uh, support, the health outcomes in this part of Baltimore are disastrous. And we just went, this guy took us on a little bus tour of all the various dumps and building sites and uh, there was like a four story high mountain of glass right across the street from a playground and you know the chemical trucks are going through and they're, they're 
offing all kinds of stuff on these children. I mean, the whole thing is really rich. So th here's the thing. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, my journalism students, my environmental writing students now are going to start picking laboratories like the Chesapeake Bay, like East Baltimore, like Delaware City, or something like that, and focus on a particular place from every point of view we can think of. Interview everybody, do natural history, do, you know, check into uh, the toxic release inventory, see what industries are dumping, who's getting exposed to it, and just write about it as thoroughly as we can. And this is something that undergraduates can do. And I think and that's a, a good example of the way journalism could be a really nice way to have an undergraduate experience that is multidisciplinary at its core. And it used to be called journalism, now it's called environmental humanities or something. But that, that seems to make sense to me. It's a nice way to watch a discipline evolve and meet the needs of, of students who I can tell you are desperate for this. They, they, really, they really like this chance. So thank you. Thanks. Holly? I'm Holly Michael. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. And I think I'm coming at um, this from a, a different perspective, from the natural science perspective. Um, I study physical processes of groundwater flow and transport of solutes in the subsurface. Um, and so uh, a large part of, of what I do is looking at coastal processes, so um, fluxes of water and of solutes across the land-sea interface. Um, I have, for example, a project um, in Indian River Bay in southern Delaware where we're looking at um, groundwater flowing into the estuary. And the reason we want to know about that is that the groundwater is the vector that transports the um, nutrients and things like pesticides that you mentioned um, that are applied you know, in agricultural fields and in people's lawns. Um, those go into the ground. They're transported by groundwater, and they end up in our streams and our estuaries. And this causes ecological problems, algal blooms, uh, eutrophication, um, fish kills, things like that. Um, and um, I also study some larger scale problems, um, looking more at human impacts on hydrogeological systems. So um, an example of that is in the Bengal Basin. And uh, earlier, Angelia talked about the problem of arsenic contamination in um, South and Southeast Asia. Um, this is naturally occurring arsenic in groundwater. Millions of people are drinking groundwater with very high uh, levels of di dissolved arsenic. So it's a big human health problem. And we're studying the physical aspects and asking questions like um, if groundwater is pumped in areas where the arsenic concentrations are low, how much groundwater can be pumped before it induces um, more contamination of, of arsenic in those uh, low arsenic aquifers. Um, and so um, while we focus primarily on these physical processes, um, I think, and I think that's interesting, that's why I got into it in the first place, one of the, the other interesting aspects about it is looking at the interactions with other aspects of the system. So I just mentioned the implications, but how does the physics interact with the ecology and, um, and the, the management and decisions that are made about these systems and the biogeochemistry, things like that. And so to do that, um, we've done a lot of interdisciplinary collaborations, um, both with other natural scientists and also, also with um, economists and social scientists. And so you know, on the, in collaborating with natural scientists, often it's biogeochemists. So in the case of the estuary, we look at how the physical processes affect biogeochemical transformation, say, of nitrogen in the subsurface before it gets out into the estuary. Um, and in the case of the Bengal Basin, we look at um, the geochemistry of the arsenic and, and how that changes as it's moving along these groundwater flow paths. Um, but, um, and both of those things, you can imagine, have pretty big implications for management. So if we understand those processes, maybe we can better understand how to manage the inputs of the nitrogen into the agricultural fields or how to manage the pumping of the groundwater um, so as not to cause more arsenic contamination. But those management implications, sort of the connection between understanding the the natural sciences and their implications for management and for human health have a lot of steps in between there. And those are steps that I know very little about. And so I think that that is where interactions with um, 
social scientists and economists and humanists are really essential because uh, we can learn all we want about these systems. I can say, you know, you definitely shouldn't pump for irrigation out of this part of the aquifer system, but unless that is somehow translated into practice, which um, in the case of the Bengal Basin, for example, is really difficult. Um, there aren't management mechanisms in place. Um, and, and there are a lot of social aspects. People in villages are worried about feeding their families and maybe not so much about, um, about the arsenic concentrations in their water. Um, and so I think getting from the, the understanding gained from the natural sciences to really maximizing the social benefits is where collaborations are, are essential. Um, I'm always writing in NSF proposals, they want to know about the broader impacts, and I say, yes, those are the broader impacts of my work. We learn about how to manage the systems, we learn about um, potential impacts on human health, but um, I think making that connection um, is what's really critical. Uh, so um, one example of how we're trying to do that, and also trying to understand the feedbacks because there are, you know, it's a two-way street. There are feedbacks between uh, what's happening in the natural system and how these systems are managed and how they're managed feed, feedback into the natural system. So um, I have, I'm collaborating with some economists here at UD in food and resource economics, Kent Messer and Josh Duke. I think I saw them earlier. Um, and in that project, we are, uh, Kent's an expert in experimental economics, and so it's a, a project about decision making. So um, how do uh, the physical aspects of the system affect ways that people, managers and water users make decisions about, um, about common resources, about, about groundwater resources. And so we can embed um, some uh, amount of realism, hydrogeologic realism in the form of physics-based models into a decision-making framework and, and try and understand how these things interact. Um, and so that's just one example of how we've been trying to approach uh, making this connection between the natural sciences and, uh, and how the results are implemented. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think this is, this is an important step, it's not an easy thing. I think interdisciplinary collaborations um, always have some challenges associated with them and maybe we'll talk about that more during our panel discussion. Uh, but I think hopefully overall it gets us a lot further than if we were to just focus on our, our individual pieces. Thanks. Holly, Andrea. Hello. Um, you've also heard quite a bit from me already so I'm gonna keep my remarks fairly short at this point. Um, but I do want to bring up um, one theme that I've, I've heard a little bit from several of our panelists so far, um, and that's our perceptions about problems and then the limits on the policy side. So we had the very nice presentation about toxics in our environment with the several mentions about how many or most of these are not regulated and um, how we have very little information presented to us as consumers about what's in the products that we consume. And a lot of um, my students tend to say, oh, well, that's a failure of policy. And I say, well, yes, but it's also a failure um, even before we get to policy. Because in my ideal world, having studied policy and studied political systems, I'd love it if government didn't have to get involved in our lives. I would love it if businesses actually provided information on their own. I would love it if they didn't generate toxic chemicals. I would love it if people understood um, you know, a lot of these things on, on their own, but they don't, right? So um, when, when we have a mismatch of information between consumers and businesses, for instance, that's one rationale for where government can get involved, and it's, it's a very good rationale. But there are limits there because as, as government policymakers, um, they have very little training in natural or social science, for instance. A lot of our policymakers um, you know, come from very diverse backgrounds. And so if you try to talk to them about science, you try to talk to them about risk, especially, um, the eyes glaze over really fast, right? Because they just don't have the background and the knowledge to, to assess risk and to understand that um, you know, with something like global warming, for instance, we, we or global climate change, I should say, um, we, we have very good science to suggest that the science, that the, um, 
global climate is changing and that humans are impacting it and that there are things that we can do to mitigate those impacts and to prepare for the future and that we should be thinking about that as we design policies across the spectrum, right? There's enough science. There may be some, um, some people who are interacting on exact sciences and processes and models and so forth as science naturally does, but there's enough sort of from a policymaking perspective, I think, to make policy. But you start talking to policymakers and you bring up the issue of risk and then you hear them, they pulled out of climate gate and said, oh my God, the researchers are fooling with the data and all of a sudden they don't want to even touch policy. They don't want to go there. They say this is too uncertain or they bring up um, their own, their sort of own impressions about it and it's hard to break that barrier, right? So there's always a limit sort of to what I call science-based decision making or evidence-based decision making on the policy side um, simply because there's a barrier between, you know, sort of science knowledge and, and the policymaker. So I always see my role as trying to take a step back from the, the natural science and say, okay, what do we know? But, but what can we, um, what can we comfortably say and how can we consolidate our information in a way to convince policymakers to do something? And if we can't convince policymakers to do something at the federal level, for instance, because they're completely gridlocked and not doing anything, um, where else can we go? What other avenues can we pursue? And one of those avenues is um, you know, more on the consumer side and more on the individual and homeowner and business side of things. So while I'm trained in governmental policy making, and that's one of the things that we teach our students is how to, how to work through the governmental process, there's also a lot, of, um, a lot of things to be learned about how other processes work in our, in our collective society and how, other, how things can be done through other ways, right? So um, I, I welcome this opportunity to talk further about options to collaborate and um, look forward to hearing feedback from all of you now or later. Great, thank you very much. So now I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, you can address your question to any particular panelist, but bear in mind that somebody may jump in and try to answer your question, even though he or she might not have been uh, originally addressed. Dave. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of talk about social movements, environmental activism, climate change, and science of policy. I've spent 25 years um, chasing science in hopes of policy as a state manager, and um, it's an exception to the rule when policy is based on science. Um, what is interesting in Delaware is that, um, you know, as we go this and, and we talk about the interdisciplinary stuff, we don't really have a curriculum that talks about training for advocacy, the critical nature to have tension created on these issues to get the dialogue and provide those teachable moments in society of our scientists and of our policymakers. Um, to create those policy moments. And I'd like to hear from each of you about whether or not that is important and whether if you're gonna have a big movement um, of this level for environmental movement, for environmental activities, is there a need to begin to think about a couple of courses or a curriculum in advocacy training? That, you know, environmental work is much more difficult. You do have to have a strong scientific background to do advocacy in the environmental movement much more than a lot of other advocacy movements. You know, so how do you link them together in an inter interdisciplinary fashion that will actually create, I think, the missing catalyst that we have to have to get this transition and translation of this science into policy? Who would like to tackle that? Can I jump, I, I, I'd like to start, and I'm sure that the rest would like to say something too, but this, uh, <clears throat> the idea that, that uh, Policy is a failure. It reminds me of something that uh, some of you may have read Philip Gurevich's book about Rwanda uh, called We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families. Uh, he said one time that, that America's failure to intervene in Rwanda was not a failure, it was a success. It was a successful implementation of a policy not to intervene. Uh, it was a brutally cynical comment. Uh, but it reminds me of a time last spring when I was down in Annapolis with some people who work for the Maryland Public Interest Research Group talking about uh, chemical, toxic chemical regulation. And 
the woman I was walking around with said, uh, let me tell you how uh, political work happens here in Annapolis on this particular issue. She said, we were walking down the, the streets in Annapolis. She said, see that guy up there? And I looked up the streets of the, of the stairs of this Capitol building, and there was a guy with like three cell phones going at once. She said, that guy makes a million dollars a year only in Annapolis lobbying for big oil and big chemical. A million dollars a year just in Annapolis, not even to say what he makes in Washington. She said, you know, when a, when a state legislator is sitting at his desk, that guy comes in one door, who's coming in on the other door? A college intern who has to go door to door with a clipboard to ask you to contribute money to pay her salary, right? So the state legislator is presented with a bill that says, do you think we should regulate bisphenol A in baby bottles or something? Million dollar lobbyist comes in one door and says no. College grad who's been scrounging just to eat comes in the other door and says yes. And this legislator has to make a decision. That's how politics actually looks on the ground. So what does political activism mean? How do you train for it? I mean, this is where I think the humanities can really contribute because you've got the science going on here and you've got the policy result over here. And in between those things is a lot of messy stuff that goes on. And how you teach someone to navigate that is, is anybody's guess. But I think all of us in the humanities could contribute a lot to that because to understand the way that process works requires a lot of thinking. It's not, it's not simply feeling like you, you've got the answer to it, something you've got a big heart or something. That's just the, just the first thing. If I could follow up on um, McKay's comment, thank you. Uh, I think when, it, when we're talking about for example, the influence of the environment on human health. Um, we have to talk about the scientific evidence. And scientific evidence, even the best of it, is always uncertain. You always have people saying, well, you can't say that this did this to someone. And uh, there's good evidence, there's bad evidence, but sometimes even the best evidence is not effective. And so I think that, in a way, advocacy has to fall ultimately not necessarily on the scientific evidence, but on morality. And so one of the things that I've been really fascinated by last semester, in fact, uh, through the help of the Disaster Research Center and a few others uh, here on campus, uh, I brought in um, another journalist who uh, writes about environmental justice issues, Steve Lerner, and he was talking about um, his book, Sacrifice Zones. And in that book, one of the central themes is this notion of, more or less, the prevention principle. Because if at the end of the day, even the best science cannot conclusively say that your exposure to this you know, pollutant in the air is what gave you lung cancer, perhaps you smoke too much. If at the end of the day, even the best science can't solve these issues, then it must be morality. There must be some sort of moral endeavor. And the prevention principle, I think, is one tool to utilize with students uh, to think about what it means. And essentially it means, well, if there's even a correlation that, that demonstrates some sort of negative health outcome, then we should try and address that, even if it's not directly conclusive. And that's where all the politics come in. So I think in, an, in, in, in thinking about advocacy and teaching students about advocacy, we have to talk to them about um, more or less morality in the, in the human experience. So this is a uh, somewhat uncomfortable topic in a university setting because advocacy has a certain kind of valence. But I'm reminded by uh, something that Adam said in uh, his reference to the good life. And of course, as a philosopher, I immediately started thinking about Aristotle. Is it, is it OK for academics to talk about better and worse outcomes and to prod students or to teach them to prod one another and to prod their government? Or is it, is it um, uh, messing with fire? I think, I think I'll just be brief. I think sociologists deal with that from the get-go. Uh, I mean, this is a perspective that is inherently a critique of all social form. And um, immediately, if uh, you're a Marxist, you're immediately biased, for example. Or if you're an advocate for various environmental positions, you're immediately biased. And all the work you do is biased. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that that's something that all academics have to deal with. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, you might produce really interesting findings, but then what do you do with it? And if you don't do anything with it, then what's the point? And so I, I think many of us you know, have to deal with that. I can also chime in on that. When, when you, one way to do, go about this is to have students study the, uh, the well-documented strategies that industries, for example, use to, manu as they say, manufacture doubt. So tobacco industries you know, pay for research. Climate change uh, or petrochemical companies will pay for research. So you know, when, when someone says, well, I think you 
caught yourself. You said, I, well, I'd like to talk about uh, global warming, I mean climate change. Well, you can actually document the guy who inserted the word climate change into the common lexicon because it sounds less threatening than global warming. So you, can, you don't have to necessarily be an advocate, but you can talk about the, uh, the very thorough and, dare I say it, scholarly efforts that, that industries, if we're talking about industries, use to create a discourse about certain things and have students, and this is a good spec to what I said earlier, but when you say I believe something, the question is how is it that you came to believe that? And when you're talking about the way a student, for example, might say, I don't believe that uh, nail polish could possibly be bad for me, or I don't believe that driving an SUV contributes to climate change, you might say, well, why, how did you arrive at that decision? You can actually trace the genealogy of their thinking. And if you can just simply document it, that may be a way just to take a scholarly approach to the way that information is transmitted. That, that might not be a bad way to, to do it. David. Yeah, one of the reasons, getting back to this point, one of the reasons that uh, policies are based on science is that the problems problem we're trying to solve are running way ahead of science, in fact. So that the global warming issue, I don't even discuss the origins of global warming in my planning class. We talk about the results that we can see on the ground and how quickly they're going to happen. So in a way, given the rapid change and increase in problems, what's going to be happening is interdisciplinary research is going to be becoming more relevant because it can't catch up with the problems. And so it doesn't give us anything really very useful to work with. But I, I uh, think I, I uh, always chafe at the phrase science-based policy, to be honest. Uh, and this, rela this relates, in a way, to my answer to Tom's question as well. Um, basing policy on bad science or no science when there's an obvious scientific component. That's just stupid. But science never can tell you what to do, what you should do, uh, how to adjudicate differences between people who value things differently. Um, so even if we knew with 100% certainty that the plastic bottle is going to cause some percentage of people over a long period of time to become sick in some particular way, does that mean that we have no more plastic bottles? Well, no, it doesn't. It might mean that, but that's not a scientific question. Uh, even when the science is clear, uh, there are a, a, a lot of other questions about what you should do, and those aren't just economic questions either, although economics in our world obviously is often the determining factor. Uh, so I, I, I think thinking that science can, if we just listen to the scientists, they, then we would do everything right, is a mistake. Um, and and uh, that relates to Tom's question, too, because I struggle with this in my class when we talk about climate change. And I say to them the first day of our discussions, we have a couple weeks on this in my nature and history class, it's where we end the semester. I said, look, in my mind, the science is, is just unquestionably clear about one thing. We are changing the world's climate in some dramatic ways uh, that will have profound consequences, and it, it really is us that's la largely involved. Um, so there's no, dis we honestly just cannot discuss that in this class. It's a waste of time, in my opinion. Um, what we can discuss is w what to do about that, why that matters. Um, climate change isn't one single problem. It's many, 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 many problems, and it's not something that we can just solve. It's going to require all kinds of adaptations, and some will be better, and some will be worse, and some will hurt some people, and some will benefit others. Uh, that we can discuss. And, and that, I never tell them what I think, uh, because the heart of the humanistic mission is to, is to get people thinking critically, analytically, asking questions. I love it when I teach that class, because the, it's a gen ed class, uh, and it draws people from all over the university, and I hope this will be true here, too. So the students really argue with each other. They, they come from many, many different, you know, some of them are material scientists, some of them are, uh, you know, IST people, some of them are uh, agriculture, some of them are marketing, some of them are historians even, or journalists. Uh, but, uh, so I'm, I, I'm not willing to say where I think the science is clear, we can discuss that. There's nothing to discuss. Uh, obviously, the scientists are constantly refining their knowledge of precisely the range of possible things that might happen depending on choices that we make or don't make. Um, but the other questions that come of that are humanistic questions and economic questions, philosophical questions. That you, again, I think you'd be stupid to think about them without having a firm grasp of, of what science tells us about the way the world works. Uh, but let me end with one plug on this. Um, 
a book that I just love by uh, a British scientist. I I've never met him, um, but he's apparently one of the foremost climate scientists in the world, Mike Holm, uh, who's at East Anglia, the famous East Anglia of, of Climate Gate, uh, running their Tyndall Center on climate change. Uh, and he, he's been working in this field for 30 years, so he must be at least late 50s, early 60s, but uh, he's, in his spare time, getting a graduate degree in history. Uh, he, he'd become frustrated uh, about the way in which climate was debated and felt that uh, a purely scientific perspective wasn't allowing him to understand uh, why these issues were so contentious, why they're so hard to act on. Um, and, he, and he ended up writing a book, which is only two years old, I think, uh, Why We Disagree About Climate Change, that I think is just a brilliant book um, that, even though he's only one guy, perfectly illustrates the benefits that I see of collaboration, because a lot of his questions come from anthropology, from history, from psychology, from business, as well as from science. If he didn't know as much as he did about science, the book would be worthless, but he also recognizes that, that science is the foundation, but it's, it's only one foundation. So and it's why we disagree about climate change. Excellent. Uh, Andrea, I'm going to let you have the last word, but um, please don't let lunch um, stand in the way of any of you asking more questions of, of the panelists. Andrea? I just want to follow up briefly on some of the points here. Um, I think that in public policy and many social sciences, we are talking about morality, we are talking about social and human questions, and it's tricky for the students to understand and get a grasp of that. They feel somewhat uncomfortable um, making, um, having discussions and, and making choices about different possible outcomes that may impact people differently. And I see uh, a very important role of ours as instructors and, and mentors is to help them get a more um, well-rounded impression of why we're struggling with these issues, what are the impacts, and, and really try to deal with the advocacy issue because um, we may have certain views, we need to do this, right? And I say, okay, well, what are the impacts of that gonna be on other people? Why might some people be resistant to what you wanna do, and how can we bridge that, that gap? How can we advance our science or our policy, but also not totally alienate half of our society as we do it. Um, so, so I think that, that those issues of morality are really important. In fact, I, I also talk to my class about climate change as if it's a moral issue, not as a science issue, because what we do about it is ultimately the moral and social decision. It's not a science decision. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll end not only because it's lunchtime um, or lunchtime in about 15 minutes. Um, we, have we been given a reprieve, is that correct? Okay, so good. We, I was gonna say I so much agree with Andrea that I wanna end, but there are other people who may disagree with her, so please, in the back. Talking about moral issues, if you have any um, intentions of incorporating a field of science that does incorporate morality. Um, I'm, I study nursing, I have a bachelor's and a master's in it, and this is a, a, a field of science that just inherently encumbers morality in its everyday teaching on the university, on the campus. And do you have anybody, just in all this discussion about health and the environment, anybody, um, have you thought about bringing on people like nurses and physicians? Because they do take a stance on the environment and health. Um, the ANA has adopted, um, the American Nurses Association has adopted the precautionary principle for its environmental health you know, stance. So just a question to you. So that they all converge on the view that illness and death is bad, is that it? <laughs> yes. I think we can all agree with that. Well, I, I, I think that, um, I think that uh, there's a sociologist who, whose name is Max Weber, and one of the things he talked about was that, um, that we, we were guiding our lives through um, a rational perspective in a way that was um, that was not good, and essentially what he what he was saying is that you know we can have lot we can have the best scientific information, but it still is not going to tell us uh, how to live our lives, and so I think that the intersection of science and morality is a fascinating is a fascinating place. It's a fascinating intersection. Uh, for example, 
Uh, again, I always hearken back to this idea of knowledge and what, what you know, determines knowledge, uh, what, what creates valid knowledge, why we think certain knowledge is valid in science is essentially the framework that we use with health and environment to, um, to determine that, but much of it is inconclusive. Um, but <clears throat> there's, for example, very conclusive, relatively undisputable evidence that if you smoke too much, something bad's gonna happen, all right? Uh, but a lot of people still smoke. And so essentially that the science is not the only thing that can uh, guide human behavior. And I think that the intersection of morality and science is a fascinating place that an interdisciplinary uh, panel and, and educational experience could try and address. Uh, I do think that they are both uh, separate and overlapping. Uh, I think that morality is, is a dimension of a cultural and historical epoch and that changes over time. Uh, and what's interesting about the scientific evidence is that it too changes over time, but in, in less profound ways and less, um, less mutable ways. So I, I, you know, I find that that's an excellent point. And um, I do think that ultimately at the end of the day, even the best scientific of, uh, information that we have is not ultimately what's going to drive policy or, or human behavior. Uh, unfortunately, there are, are interests politically, economically, and so forth that um, are powerful and can override both of those. So, but I, I think that that's an excellent point and would be a great experience for an interdisciplinary educational experience. So what about bringing people into class who disagree with you with respect to moral issues? I mean, we, we know that that's probably not the best idea to, to bring in um, people who are going to um, perhaps disagree with your data on some scientific point, but we know that, that morality is not um, often so cut and dried. So what, what about giving, um, giving a platform for those people who disagree about certain fundamental uh, moral moves in your argument? Any of you thought about that? Do you encourage it in your classroom? I certainly do. I, I always try to make sure that my students can respond if they feel uncomfortable with what's going on. They can criticize me if I make a, a point they don't agree with. Um, but I, as a, I'm a researcher, right? I'm an analyst. So I want them to explain it to me. Why do they believe the way they do? What evidence, even if it's not scientific, what evidence are they using to form that opinion? I want it explained because maybe they can change my mind. Maybe, maybe not. But. Um, I at least want them to spell it out. So I had a, one of my students this semester say the thing he learned from class was that he had to explain himself. And I thought that was interesting. Um, I, d I don't think about it so much, but to him it was really um, sort of eye-opening how much I was expecting. I want you to tell me how you got from point A to point Z all along the way, rather than just tell me what your, what your vision, your conclusion, your opinion was. Uh, all the way in the back, Rich. One of the um, takeaways that I, I see in all of the, the theme here is the lack of discussion of business or maybe business is bad. In other words, they're putting all these toxic materials in their products from the lawn care people to the, you know, just down the list. How do we integrate business and <clears throat> we as consumers into this whole equation that we're talking about here. Because it's a real key element. Um, I've done a little bit, I teach a course in the business school on sustainability and green business. Um, you know, one of our themes in the environmental area is innovation as well. Um, that means new products, new ideas, you know, green marketing, uh, all of these things. And then you get into some of the issues that we're talking about of, or Claim, claim support for this and proof that these are safe. You talked about REACH, you know, in the European Union where everything is assumed, chemicals are assumed to be bad by definition, whereas uh, in the U.S. system, it's, you have to prove that it's bad. So we've got all of this regulation overlaid with business and our choices as consumers. How do we integrate this more effectively into this discussion? Can I, I'd really like to answer that because this is, this is something I would be overjoyed to take part in if there was a way to collaborate with the business school. I, I had a student come into my class who said, um, we happen to be talking about chicken manufacturing and algae blooms and 
political pressure and all that sort of thing. And she had just come from a business class where she had raised her, she had been fully indoctrinated by my thing and had gone into her class and when they were talking about the chicken industry in her class, in the business class, she said, well, what about things like chicken manure running off into the Chesapeake or, uh, you know, the arsenic that's showing up in uh, their feed or, you know, the abuse of uh, immigrant labor or all the various things that we talk about. And uh, the, she, I, I can't say that I know who said this, but someone said, the professor or the, another student said, those are just externalities. We don't really care about that. What we care about is finding the bottom line. I guess if maybe what my, I should be called a professor of externalities. That's really <laughs> what, I, what I mainly focus on is not just who's making money, but who's paying the price, I guess. That's, the, that's what I teach. But the, it, it really struck me that day that uh, she could go from a class talking about only about externalities to going it seems to me to go into a class where she was being taught to disregard, they, she was being taught to disregard externalities. That's, that's the, the takeaway that she had from that class. That externalities are not something that you need to worry about in a, I don't even know what kind of class it was, a management class of some sort, but don't sweat that stuff, let someone else deal with that, which is, I, I, um, I would like to have that conversation somehow. Uh, it would be really very fruitful, I think. Yes, Jan. I'm uh, very interested in the uh, morality of global climate change. And of course, one of the big factors is that the people who are suffering the most are those least responsible. I mean, people in Africa and other poor developing countries. People in Africa and other poor developing countries uh, are suffering the most in the climate change that's already occurred, you know, whether it's a drought in Africa or the spread in malaria or crop failures and various other things. These people are living on the edge. They maybe get by on a dollar or two a day. Their life depends on agriculture, and when the when the crops don't grow, you know they're starving. And I've heard estimates ranging from 100 to 300,000 people a year dying prematurely already from the climate change that already occurred. But we're pretty much insulated from that so far because you know we have the wherewithal to move or adapt to do what we need to do. But uh, right here, closer in Delaware, I'm on this Delaware sea level rise. Uh, advisory committee uh, with Dave Carter and you know I'm concerned about the moral and ethical issues involved in climate change in Delaware. Uh, it turns out that there are some people who live maybe in trailers in Sussex County or people who are not very high income who live along the coast maybe along the bay in communities who don't have the wherewithal to raise their homes or to buy property somewhere else and uh, it's very likely that we're gonna get a meter of sea level rise by the end of the century and possibly considerably more than that depending on what happens to the ice in Greenland and Antarctica. And who is going to come up with the money to uh, move those people or elevate their houses or build the roads to their communities that are gonna be underwater at high tide? Who's gonna pay for that? Who has the responsibility for it? Um, and so, you know, to me, those are very uh, close to home issues that we are gonna be dealing with in Delaware. One of the things that the sea level rise committee has found so far is that for one meter rise, we lose about 3% of the residences in Delaware. They'll be uninhabitable because they'll be basically underwater. Right. So let me generalize on your question, if I may. So science for whom, um, for whose sake? Is that a consideration um, when scientists think about what to study? Should they consider the community or the region, should they consider the wealth of the particular population? I think, it's, I think it's indisputable that those sorts of populations are the ones who bear the brunt of um, environmental, well, I, I don't know a whole lot about the climate change issue, but in terms of uh, toxic pollutants, industrial pollutants, uh, it's no coincidence that the uh, racial uh, minority, ethnic minority, and, and lower social class communities tend to be adjacent to these things. Either they're built after the fact or the, or the industries are built uh, next to these communities because they simply don't have the power. So, you know, there's a, there's a degree of exploitation and uh, I don't think that, um, I think that science for whom might not be the, the best question to ask. I think that uh, we need to, to think about fundamentally, you know, the, the human condition and uh, exploiting those people who, who lack power uh, by people who do have it um, for profit and for other reasons. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think that uh, fundam as, a, as a sociologist, I can't help but think about those people. Uh, <clears throat> and um, we have to care enough 
uh, in, in order to make the sorts of changes, uh, because we certainly we certainly don't. But but it's very easy also, as you kind of suggest, to uh, to live a more privileged and buffered experience. And in fact, in many ways, I think we have to ask ourselves these sorts of questions because the privileged experience that you might have on a day-to-day -day basis is precisely because other people are exploited. And I think it's a question that we, we all need to ask ourselves. So uh, Janine, I'd like to uh, offer you the last question if you'll be brief and the responses will be brief and at 12.45 we'll go to lunch. Thank you everybody for your input today. I'm gonna direct this toward um, perhaps McKay and Andrea. Um, as a scientist, one of the most difficult things for me to teach my students is how to effectively communicate what we're doing to the public, why it's important. And we're all used to writing scientific papers and proposals, and we're all used to arguing and communicating with other scientists, but we do produce documents for Congress every time we write a grant proposal. If we want to influence policy, we need to be able to forget about those little details that make us really excited, thinking we're gonna get a nature paper, and, and focus on the big picture. So in the program that we're talking about developing at UD, is there any um, consideration of a way to teach people in different disciplines to communicate more effectively? Uh, scientists to communicate to poli policy makers, to communicate to politicians. Um, so you're speaking specifically of the Environmental Humanities Initiative? Or, or, or at or UD other. in general, right. because I think scientists in general, in order to sort of validate their tax dollars, need to be able to communicate what they're doing. Um, sure, I'll take a shot at that. Um, in our policy program, for instance, um, we do spend some time trying to teach our students how to write for policymakers, where they need to integrate quite a lot of different disciplines in a very concise, short fashion, because most policymakers don't want to read anything more than a page, right? So we're teaching them how to, to get sort of to a general audience on that. But, Right. We, we um, as it happened, I, I yesterday was meeting with Ann Artis, uh, one of the deans of the College of Arts and Sciences, and this was exactly one of the issues that we have on our agenda. It's not going to happen instantly, but but um, the College of Arts and Science already has a wonderful program for its own graduate students to help them become more effective um, presenters slash performers, because really that's what it ultimately is about. Uh, and I, I think that, that, from my point of view, and I'm sure McKay and I haven't talked about it, but I, I can't imagine he wouldn't agree, is one of the things that, that would be very exciting to, to, to do down the road is to, to find a way to work with people uh, in the science and policy area who, who would like to, to uh, think about how they might boil their stuff down to a headline or the the, you know, the famous pitch in the movie industry, you know, in the elevator, the, the five seconds that you get to say why your stuff is important, what's the cool idea. Um, that's an, only one type of, of way that we could do this. But I, I think it's something that interests me. I was, you know, the, the, the dean brought it up, so I know that it interests people uh, in the college administration, and, and, you know, it's certainly part of what McKay has been doing. So. Can I, I'll just really quick just put in two cents. Uh, I'd like to just bring to your attention, if you don't know about it, uh, something called the Oberlin Project, which is being done at Oberlin College by a guy named David Orr, who's been an environmental studies professor for a long time. And it is, uh, it's a place that I would love to try to, I would like to go there and absorb this firsthand, but what I understand from reading about it, uh, he is doing a really interesting project, integrating the community, the college community, with the community around it. So he is, for example, thinking about things like how can we get uh, farmers who live five miles from campus to provide the food for the campus, right? How can we have land use planning that's being done in the town uh, informed by the land use scholarship that's being done on campus? And this is when, when Victor and I were talking earlier about Delaware City, for example. There's, there's, you know, we, we are used to talking to policymakers, but there's also a role that we can play as an institution with the community that is not policy, but just the community. We can offer, I mean, imagine if instead of uh, a couple hundred 
professors in here, we had a couple hundred people from uh, Newark or Wilmington that were in here talking about all this stuff, so that we are downloading all the incredible research that we have all done in here to the people who actually don't have access to it. And uh, not just talking, in other words, at the very highest level, but talking at the very lowest level and getting this stuff out, because in the, the field that I've been working on, the policymakers never lead the charge. They always follow, I mean, this is what politicians do, they follow the herd. So what we want to do is talk to the herd. Like, you want to talk to the people and say, look, this is in your power to actually change something. Now, you go do the work on the policymakers, and once they have access to information, maybe things actually will will shift. So I, I, in other words, I think in, integrating the institution and the community at, at large is a project that would be well worth uh, pursuing. Okay, and Holly has a comment and then we'll break for lunch. I just have a quick comment um, from, um, uh, as a scientist, um, one of the things that you know, we've been, as we were talking, um, I think, you know, you were saying, oh, well, we can take uh, the fact that global warming or, you know, climate change is occurring as maybe a given. But I think, especially in environmental sciences, um, in almost everything we do, there's quite a lot of uncertainty. And I think one of the big challenges in communication beyond, you know, telling people what the big picture is and what the exciting piece of your research is, is communicating the uncertainty and what the implications of that uncertainty is. And I think that that feeds back into everything you're talking about. Like you, once we have the scientific information, what do we do with it? But the uncertainty of that information, I think, is a big piece of it. And I, I think that that's a, a big challenge as well. So I want to thank the panel for beginning this dialogue, and please continue. <laughs>